Recording in progress. Thank you, Quinn. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see uh, a full council chamber this afternoon. And, and I'm new at this job here, so take it easy on me. <laughs> so we'll give it a shot. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. And I want to reiterate what uh, Annalene, our clerk, said. Uh, anyone here for the public meeting, uh, please make sure you sign in on the appropriate form. All right, so uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest this afternoon? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the previous minute. Uh, folks, if you want to come in, there might be another uh, chair or two over here. Just come in and find a seat. Um, so we're going to move along as, as people come and go. So our resolution 2022, moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Gunson, with the minutes of the town of, of Minto, November 22nd, 22 regular council meetings be approved. All in favor of that? Against, that's carried. So we, we have a resolution to move council into committee of adjustment, uh, moved by Councillor Zimmerman, seconded by Councillor Potnovitz, that the town of Minto council convene into Committee of Adjustment. All in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you. So I think we have five public meetings today. So we're going to move right into them. I'm going to first public meeting is uh, MV 2022-14 and it's the CRIDAC uh, on 200 Mental Road. And, uh, so I'm chairman of the meeting and I'd like to call the meeting to this hearing to order. I'm going to state that any decision reached by the committee today cannot be used to set a precedent. Each application considered by the committee is dealt with on its own merits and not two applications are exactly the same. So the public hearing is to consider a minor variance application, MV 2022-14, CRIDAC Developments, Inc. I'm going to ask uh, Clerk McRobb to uh, give us some information. Uh, thank you, Chair Turton. The property subject to the proposed minor variance application is legally described as concession one, part lot 24 Minto, par parts four and five, 61R9419, Town of Minto, and is municipally known as 200 Minto Road in the Town of Minto. The subject property is approximately 6.26 acres or 2.53 hectares. The purpose and effect of the minor variance application is to provide relief from section 37.30A and section 6.27.8 of the Town of Minto's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 0186 as amended to permit for re reduced residential zone setback and a reduction in the amount of required parking spaces. Section 37.30A requires minimum setback for industrial buildings and structures of 70 meters or 229.7 feet from abutting residential zones where a 7.6 meter, 24.9 foot setback is proposed. Section 6.27.8 requires a minimum of 226 parking spaces, whereas 168 parking spaces are proposed to be provided. Additional relief may be considered at this meeting. The notices were mailed to the property owners within 200 feet or 60 meters of the subject property, as well as the applicable agencies and posted on the subject property on November 17th, 2022. Reports and comments were received uh, and attached for council to review from the town of Minto, from Wellington County, and Andrew Bauman, a neighboring landowner with a letter of support. Um, I know that uh, registered to speak today are Sashin and Shivani, um, as well as Amy Hofar uh, from uh, COVID Engineering, who is the applicant, and the other two are the owners. And back to you, Chair Turner. Thank you. Clerk McRobb, so we're going to ask Ashley Sawyer, uh, the Town of Minto Planning Coordinator, to pr provide some comments, please. Perfect. Uh, so as Annalene mentioned, the subject property for the proposed minor variance is located at 200 Minto Road in the Palmerston Industrial Park. The owner is currently in the process of finalizing the site plan control um, to facilitate the construction of approximately 140,000 square feet of a private industrial condominium development. That development will have three buildings. The first one will be for offices, the second for professional slash workshop units, and the third for warehouses that will primarily be used for uh, shipping, receiving um, for storage purposes. Uh, so Wellington County's Planning Department, Source Water Protection, and Maitland Valley Conservation Authority have all noted no concerns. Uh, town staff note that we are recommending the approval of the requested relief. 
The property is currently zoned as industrial site specific. This is a blanket zoning that was applied to the entirety of the Palmerston Industrial Park when it was initially being developed. At that point in time, the town did not have a light industrial zone and the intent of the site specific zoning was to provide for additional buffer space between the proposed industrial park and the existing residential dwellings on Main Street West. Town staff note that removing the site specific provision from the industrial park is on our list of housekeeping amendments. However, for the sake of timing, the developer has opted to move forward with the minor variance and include it with their parking reduction. Um, they are proposing a reduced distance um, of 7.6 meters or 24.9 feet, um, which is what is permitted with the standard industrial zoning right now, um, just not with this site specific that's in place from when the industrial park was developed. They are also pro proposing some additional buffering with coniferous trees native to Ontario on the rear of the property and fencing along the interior side yards. The layout of the site will also help mitigate potential land use conflicts, but if a residential um, development comes to fruition on the adjacent sites, it would be the responsibility of the developers of the residential to uh, provide additional buffering if necessary through noise mitigation measures, etc. Um, that's because the industrial park is pre-existing and the use was there prior. Um, as for parking, town staff are satisfied with a minimum of 168 parking spaces being provided. The applicant and their consultants have indicated that the reduction is required to facilitate a more efficient site layout um, and functionality for truck movement, including fire trucks, uh, loading docks, overhead door accesses, and visual appeal for landscaping. The applicant is currently in the process of exploring options to provide approximately 20 to 25 more parking spaces, but they have brought forward the minor variance um, to expedite the development process. So that being said, the 168 is the absolute minimum they would be providing. Um, because this is a private industrial style condo development and the majority of tenants are still unknown, the parking rates are based on an average condition. The applicant has indicated that with the difference in timings of businesses and the different business types, they believe 168 parking spaces is substantial for their needs. Uh, the site plan control process must still be completed. Uh, we're coming down home stretch on that. And as Annalene noted, we did have a letter of support from the neighboring property owner. And I'm here if you have any questions, as is the owner and the applicant. Thank you, Ashley. So we are now going to ask the owner or the applicant, uh, Shivani and Sasha Shirami, the, and the owners, and Amy Hofart. Can you step up to the podium, please? Introduce yourself. Hi, this is Sachin Shiromani, and that's Shivani that's Shiromani. Yep, this is me. We have Amy and Dana on the call. Good afternoon, ladies. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. So is there anything else that you want to add to other than uh, what Ashley has already commented on? I think that's, that's what we've uh, been discussing with them, and uh, we are exploring the option of increasing the parking spaces wherever we can, uh, about 2025, like Ashley just mentioned. Yeah. So, but we wanted to uh, expedite the matter and we wanted to proceed with this uh, ahead in the minor variance. So that's why we did not do any changes to the drawings that we have right now. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to, so we have no registered speakers in favor or against. So we're gonna move along to the next one and that's uh, questions from the committee. Uh, council, questions. <clears throat> Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Anderson. Thank you, Mayor uh, Turkey. I'm just wondering about uh, contingency plans for parking because parking becomes a huge, huge issue. And as you don't know your clientele that are going to be filling the space, you may think that 160 will do. What happens when it doesn't? Well, well uh, that's exactly what we're trying to explore and, and have more parking spaces, about 25. Yes. Now, specifically for building one is going to be what we propose to have is healthcare people, um, the healthcare professionals, which would probably uh, take out, uh, you know, the um, having more and more parking there. So that's exactly where the maximum parking space would be required. The third building is morely, mostly warehouses with very minimal parking just for their trailers that they're going to be uh, loading and unloading. So that is what there is. The building two, which is the center building, has workshops or industrial units, wherein uh, they have their mini trucks, which can go inside the unit as well. So that's where we're looking at that. And that's how we're thinking about that. Um, no more parking would be required based on the types of usage of the buildings and basis of the nature of people that are gonna be occupying it. Still, uh, 
to ensure that we don't do not land into a into a position that the parking space becomes cramped we and the consultants are looking at creating more spaces wherever we can uh, at least 25 we're thinking of we've thought of it but we've not put it on drawing right now yeah thank you uh, other questions from the council okay so we've had a rebuttal and response uh, i'm gonna ask uh, are we not a lot of questions on this. Um, are we looking to approve or uh, I'm going to recommend that we get Annalene to read the approval document. Thank you, Mayor Turton. Um, so the resolution I am providing uh, must be carried or defeated. The notice of decision of the Committee of Adjustment is to be signed by all members of the Committee of Adjustment in favor of that decision. The motion reads that the Town of Minto Committee of Adjustment approves the application by Credac Developments, Inc for a property legally described as concession one, part lot 24 Minto, parts four and five, six one R9419, town of Minto, municipally known as 200 Minto Road in the town of Minto, provide relief from section 37.30A and section 6.27.8 of the town of Minto's comprehensive zoning bylaw 01-86 as amended to permit for a reduced residential zone setback of 7.6 meters or 24.9 feet and a minimum of 168 parking spaces. I would just require a mover and a second to three you, Bridge, or Mayor of Turton. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Zimmerman. Any other questions in reference to this motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Against, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, so anyone wishing to receive a copy of the notice of decision and of the co uh, committee of adjustment in respect to the minor variance application must make a written request to the clerk of the town of minto at 5941 highway 89 harriston nog 10 or you can email annaline at the town of minto dot minto dot on dot ca and i'm going to officially adjourn uh, this public meeting so thank you very much and thank good you. luck Thank you so much. So you, you folks, uh, if you want to stay, you can. If not, you can uh, give your seat up for somebody else. Of the whole way. <laughs> it's a nice way to put it. <laughs>
Um, council has the authority to amend the requirements uh, that are currently in the designation, uh, allowing you to remove, amend, or add additional uh, conditions as, as uh, deemed fit. Uh, and the other would be other option would be to uh, revoke the dangerous dog uh, designation in its entirety. Uh, if there's any questions on the process, I'd be happy to take those. Questions from council for our CDO. Mayor Turton. Go ahead. Uh, Through you, Mayor Turton. Just for clarification, uh, Terry, what types of dogs are we talking about? Uh, Cam will be able to speak to that. I haven't been involved with the actual attack itself. Okay. It makes a difference whether it's a, a Shih Tzu or, or, you know, pit bull. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Terry. So next speaker, I'll ask uh, Town of Minto bylaw enforcement officer to provide information relating to the incident uh, that is the subject of the hearing. Uh, Mr. Cam Forbes. Members of Council, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the first notif notification I got about this dog was on the 2nd of September uh, when the complainant said that that Coda, Rebecca's dog, Coda, had attacked uh, her dog. Um, so I, I gave them the option they can, we can fine or, you know, we can uh, deem the dog as dangerous. It's up to them. I was told that she'd discuss it with her husband. I heard nothing back until September 26th when Coda had attacked the same dog again. Uh, both times this dog has been off the, off the property, off the, the owner's property when it's attacked the neighbor's dog. So, and according to the complainant, this dog has, has done this on numerous occasions. And anyways, um, that's pretty much all I've got. I, I did send a, a letter out to Rebecca on the 30th of September, deeming Coda as a dangerous dog. And on the 14th, uh, she came into the town office and wishing to appeal the designation. So that's pretty much all I have on that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna ask uh, the participants uh, if, if there's uh, any questions uh, for the bylaw officer, Mr. Forbes, uh, Rebecca Palmer, are you present? Yes, I am present. Do you wanna step up to the mic, please? Sure. Hello. Um, so will you state your name, please? And uh, uh, Rebecca Palmer. So uh, and I'm the owner of the dog. Okay, thank you. So any questions? Uh, is there anything that you want to add uh, to a, a Cam's report? Um, just that I believe that my dog is not a dangerous dog. Um, she does bark, has a scary bark. She's King Corso Lab mix. Um, the event in question, I was cutting my grass and then my landlord, or my landlord, sorry, my neighbor came barging in the yard saying that my dog had attacked their dog on their property. Um, my dog was in the yard when I looked up when she came in. I did not see her leave or witness anything. And if she, I'm not saying she didn't because I like I said I was cutting my grass and my fence had been broken um, just before that I had a house fire on August 16th so part of my fence was destroyed so I can't maybe she did go over there um, the two dogs had have had an issue since they moved in two years ago um, I asked to see the dog and she said it was inside I've never, like, I, I don't believe the dog was, if there was an altercation, I don't believe the dog was, or my dog was hurt. I don't know. I don't believe my dog is dangerous. There's many people that, or, and strangers that are around her often, and she has never, ever bit anyone or another dog or anything in the eight years I've had her. I rescued her a few years ago. Okay, uh, questions, any, any council members have uh, questions for Rebecca? Uh, 
Councillor Dirksen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Turton. Um, <laughs> hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I believe it was our bylaw enforcement officer that said that the neighbor said this had happened on several occasions. This is the first I've heard of it that my dog, like one time, that my, that they said something to me that my dog had went on their property. And so you never home. heard any other time that anything had happened? Um, once they said that my dog, like again, since the fire and like I had, I had built a fence when they moved in um, because the dogs did bark at each other. And, um, but since the fire, there was one other time that it, she had called me and said that my dog was off the property and was scaring people, which, um, and that's all I called her and she came back. I didn't, um, not, to my knowledge, no incident had happened or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson, please. Thank you, Mayor Turton. So do you have a way of containing the dog on your property? Well, I'm not even at that property right now. The house was deemed unlivable since um, the house fire in August. This past August? Yeah. Okay, but so when, I, you, when you did reside there, was there a way to contain the dog? Yes, there was. I had a, a chain also that I didn't use really because I fenced in the backyard so that it was enclosed. So when the fence was damaged, you were still living there for a time though? I was living in a tent in the backyard briefly, yes. Okay. And I did try to assemble a bit of a blockade again, but apparently not. So the dog was never on a chain or a leash to control it? Because it, it's clear that you have to control your dog. Absolutely, I agree. Right? A dog can't be running. I agree. My law is clear. You have to protect people. You have to protect I, other animals. The dog is your responsibility. Absolutely, I agree. So the instance where she was out? Twice in eight years after the fence was broken, yes. And I... Uh, yes, apparently she was... Well, once for sure, I know. And the other time... Apparently she was off the yard and that is my responsibility. Yes, I, but I still don't believe that she's a dangerous She'd dog. She'd be a pretty good sized dog, I'm assuming, if she's a King Corso lab mix? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Elliott, go ahead. My question is, if it's a dangerous dog, how, what were the type of injuries? How bad were they? Did you have to go to the vet? Uh, um, that... That's, that's probably a big reason why uh, I would be concerned about the possibility of injuring another dog or injuring even another child or a person. So I, have you any idea what kind of... No, I share that question as well, sir. I, I, I've never seen, like, like I said, I was refused to, to see the dog and I've never been given a vet anything. Like uh, the dog that night, the police were called and when they attended my property, they said that it's not a police con uh, office police concern unless a dog bites a person. Um, so it was a bylaw thing. And that, I guess when possibly they called you guys. Um, but the dog was outside that night, like they were out having a fire and the dog was running around and um, not my dog, their dog and looked like sounded well. So, but I, I don't know, I've never seen a vet, vet consultation or nothing myself. Would anybody know? Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get a chance, uh, Ron. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hold, excuse me one second, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, please stay at the mic and we'll have an opportunity to rebut in a moment or two. So your questions are answered, Ron? Yeah. Uh, other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Dirksen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Turton. Sorry, one more question. Um, so this all transpired uh, back, started in August, so more than three months ago now. Have you done anything to try to change the behavior of, of CODA or? Um... I don't believe that there is an issue with CODA's behavior, but I definitely have done something in regards of like, she is never, ever, ever, all like loose or um, especially when I visited the property, I've kept her like in my car um, just to avoid any, you know, possible issues. But um, 
as to her behavior, I, she's, she's a friendly dog. Like she does have, like I said, she is, she is a big dog. She does have a rather scary bark. Um, and she is slightly protective of her territory. Um, so if somebody was to knock or come, you know, she would bark or, um, but to bite or to attack is not something she's ever done. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Potterman. Um, you mentioned that the house was burnt. Are you are you living there currently or no? Or no. Do you intend to go back there? I'm not sure. My landlord is. That's a whole of well, kind of another issue. My landlord is trying to evict me. She has already has other tenants that are going to be that she can up the rent a lot higher than me. So I'm not entirely sure if I will be going back there or not. So where's the dog house now? Um, well, between a friend of mine and my mother right now, she's in the car. If anybody would like to meet her and see that she's not vicious. Um, here, there and everywhere, my sons. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, so if, if, there, she, if she is here and there and everywhere and she's currently deemed a dangerous dog, what methods of control are being used to control her wherever it is that she is currently? Well, she's either tied up or on a leash with me or in my car or um, I haven't gone to get this insurance and stuff like that because I because of this date and I was hoping to have it revoked. So is she muzzled when she's on a leash? No. So she's out in public. Like if, if I was living across the street and I had a dog that size coming across onto my property. She's not ever on anybody's property that she's not permitted she on. on. Yes, this she was. Instance, right? Yes. Um, and I'm assuming it wasn't the first time she would go to the property. Wouldn't be unusual for her, right? If no. she's accustomed to going to that property. No. Oh, like where I lived? Yeah. On the other neighbor's property. She wasn't accustomed to going on the neighbor's right, so property. So this was a one-off instance. Twice, apparently. All right, so the measures that have been imposed are not being adhered to currently. The measures that are spelled out, she's to be muzzled if she's out, you're to have insurance on her. I do, not, I do not have her muzzled and I do not have the insurance, but she is at all times in my, like, in, if she's not with my care, she's enclosed somewhere where she's not with access to public or for anything to happen. Like she's on a leash when she's with me. Okay, thank you. So the fire, any other questions? The fire was mid, mid August. Uh, up until then there was a fence and with the fire, the fence was knocked down. What did you put the, was the fence installed by yourself because, yes. of, the, because of the dog? Because of the dog's barking, yes. Okay. And I had on separate occasions asked them if our dogs could meet on a neutral ground, just because she's never had other problems with other animals. Um, if they could meet on neutral ground to like just get it over and done with and figure that they, but that was not, not uh, didn't happen. Okay, uh, no other questions from council? Rebecca, thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to ask uh, uh, Jane Pointer, who uh, is the victim or the witness to give uh, your statement. Thank you. Would you state your name, please? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Janie Pointer. So you, you go ahead. Oh, <clears throat> our dogs did meet at one point. I had, oh, sorry, my daughter. I had, um, I was talking to Becky and I was in my yard. My dog was off the leash, but she stays in our yard for the most part. Um, and Coda was on a leash and she said, yeah, they can meet and my dog went to sniff her and Coda started charging and barking at her immediately. So my dog backed up. I took her in the house. So that was just one occasion. That was when we first, first summer we moved in there. So it would have been two years ago-ish. I couldn't give you an exact date. Also, after she did come into our property and bite my dog, she, we were, had, I had taken her to my neighbor's house so I never, ever talked to her after I had in, confronted her in her yard. So I, she never asked to see the dog from me because I would have showed her. Now, when she got bit, 
it was just a small puncture mark and it was bleeding a little bit. My neighbor, she's here as well, Michelle, she saw the whole thing and came out and grabbed my dog. Um, Coda had watered, wandered onto our property multiple times. She had never bitten Shira like that hard before. So they kind of, she would just, when Coda runs over to our house and sees my dog, she just charges her and attacks her. Like my dog doesn't even, my dog goes like this and crouches. Like she tries to run in my house when she sees Coda. What kind of a dog do you have? I have a half German Shepherd, half Rottweiler mix. She is on the smaller side, like for that breed, she's smaller. She's not massive. She's about the same size as Coda though. But she, my dog plays with Michelle's dogs across the street. She plays with my other neighbor, Trevor's dogs, Snow. Um, she's never gotten in a fight with another, another dog ever. So really there's right only way. been uh, the two altercations. Mm, there's been more, there's been other situations where I haven't been there, which my husband will tell you about because um, I was at work. Um, but yeah, if sometimes my mother-in-law will be out with my daughter and they'll just see Coda on the street. So they stop. And then when we're calling Becky, like yelling her name to come and get the dog, there's been other times when neighbors have called me being like, Coda's outside, get the kids in the house, get the dogs in the house. Like all the neighbors call each other when she's out and she's out all the time. And I even offered Becky a leash and she said, I don't need one. She doesn't usually wander out of the yard but she does when she had the fence up it was pretty good but as soon as that fence came down it was worse so when the fence was up uh likely uh, coda was never out rarely so on occasion she would come out i guess pop out the front door okay i mean that happens so we never said anything we understand that the dog will run out the door sometimes and you don't get them we didn't want to make a big stink about it the you know first couple times but it started being continuous so it's a problem now and she's biting my dog okay uh that's nothing further i don't think so okay so i'm gonna ask uh, rebecca uh, i'm gonna ask the participants if there's any questions for the witness or victim so rebecca you're first on the list if there's anything that you want to ask um, would you please uh, come up to the mic, please? Maybe, Jane, you could just allow her to go to the mic. Thank you. I did ask to see her, and you said that she had birds brought in the house. Did you ever take her to the vets, or was there any injuries to the dog if this did happen? You literally never asked me to see the dog. I don't know why you're saying that. When you were in my yard, I said, oh my gosh, is she okay? Yeah. I tied Dakota up on her chain. Okay. And then I said, like, is she okay? You said she's bleeding from her hip. Yeah. And I said, can I see her? You said she's in the garage. And then you jumped on the lawn tractor to go get Fred at the neighbors. Yeah. So I didn't deny you. I just was getting my husband. And I apologize if I, I don't remember hearing that at all. I don't remember asking you to say that to me. I'm pretty sure you didn't. Was she ever taken to the vet? She was not. It was just a little pinprick hole, so we didn't feel the need to take her to the vet. And as that's it. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Now I'm going to ask if there's any parties in the council that want to ask uh, Jane questions. Uh, Rebecca, that's fine. You can uh, sit down. Thank you. Uh, Jane, if you want to stay there at the podium, questions? Go ahead, Councilor Gunson. So in the document, it says that once a week for the last four weeks, um, Coda was over to your yard and bit your dog. Yes. So only, sorry, go did ahead. you let Becky know this every time that happened? Because if she thinks it's only happened twice and it's been four times, like do we tell her every time it happens or we just accept it and move on or? I'm pretty sure the first time I didn't say anything because I figured, you know, she got out by accident, but I told her definitely two times. I'm pretty sure I told her all three times because I need to get her to get the dog because okay. it's running around. Do you think, like, I've got a couple big dogs and when they yeah. play, it sometimes they look yeah. aggressive. Yeah. Even though they're, they get along. Yeah. 
sometimes it doesn't look like that or is it every time it's vicious no it's vicious like my dog's yelping okay thank you other questions deputy mayor anderson thank you mayor Turkey. so is your dog controlled or is it running loose on your property it runs loose on my property but she doesn't leave the property she never leaves the property not unless like she's playing with the dogs like sometimes me and the neighbor's dogs will let them play on the street together okay because in town dogs are to be kept under control like if your neighbors if the issue is that the neighbor's dog is loose and your dog is loose perhaps if your dog was on a leash you would have been able to prevent it i'm not saying that i i think both of you are the wrong personally the dogs are to be controlled there's the potential of a dog harming a child or another dog and they need to be controlled thank you thank you Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Councillor Potnovitz. Uh, yes, through you, uh, Mayor Turton. Uh, is there any other incidents of, of Coda attacking any other dogs in the neighborhood? Um, she's gone after my neighbor's dog. She was here. Um, she's gone after what? She's yeah, that's why I said she's here. Sorry, and then she's gone after my daughter's best friend's dogs. <clears throat> that he lives down the road on Brock. Um, he had, to, he was watching his mother-in-law's dog and Coda attacked that dog. And then his, he has another dog and he, he kind of got in the middle and got Coda off of the other dog. I also know my neighbor across the street from me, Jordan, who also lives on Brock street. She had a puppy when she first moved in and Coda kept coming over, who was also, who was always leashed and Coda came over and kept biting it. And that dog came aggressive and she got rid of it. And she couldn't come because she has a baby and kids. And go ahead, Councillor Elliott. So, one of your statements was that the neighbor's phone is that get your kids, get your animals out. So, has this dog ever attacked or been aggressive with people, or kids, or fear that the other one might be attacked or what? Yeah, she came right up to my daughter one time and was snarling in her face and growling and barking. I wasn't there at the time, so I didn't want to make that statement because I wasn't there. I was at work, but um, my dog ended up running from the side and kind of pushing Coda out of the way. And then, and this was also on my property. And then um, they the dogs tussled in the street and then Coda had my dog by the neck and she was she didn't get hurt she wasn't bleeding like she was okay but she was like yelping and then Becky came over and got her and um we put the other dog in the house like our so dog in the house the dog off, is it aggressive to the person that's pulling him off uh did you pull Becky him off came in the yard and got him actually okay so Becky seen a whole incident Came in our backyard, yelled at the dog, and pulled him off. Okay. Are there questions? So, uh, our bylaw officer, Mr. Cam Forbes, do you have questions for? Uh, oh, just a clarification James. on the fence. The Can fence. you come to that microphone? Sorry. Yes. Please go to the microphone, uh, Cam. The fence was installed because Becky put in a swimming pool, so under our bylaw. Uh, she was required to install the fence. It, it had nothing to do with the dog. It was the fence was up before that. It just wasn't the fence went up. Office. No, it wasn't. The fence. There was no fence along the cedar tree. Cedar excuse trees me, don't constitute a fence. Uh, Cam is talking. Would everybody else please be quiet? You'll have a turn. Thank there was a partial ahead. fence installed, but because because there's cedar trees between the two neighbors, a uh, fence had to be installed down that side. To to contain well to contain the dog and to keep the children out of the swimming pool so both dogs have yes they have both been off their properties um janie's dog i i received a call once because this woman is scared to death of dogs and the dog was over at her place it it all worked out it wasn't a big deal but anyway so they both they both have been have uh, caught running at large other than that i got nothing else Okay, any, any other questions uh, from council for uh, our bylaw officer? Okay, thank you. So next on the list here is uh, 
I'm going to call for applicant or appellant to provide their statement and evidence for uh, Rebecca. She okay. All right. So. What does that? Sorry. What does that mean? That was. Uh, does Rebecca have any witness or anything in favor of the pub? I do. Pardon me. I do, sir. Okay. Uh, you do, Rebecca. Would yes. you have them step up to the mic, please, and uh, say state their name? Hello, my name's Stacy. Okay, Stacy. Are you? Sorry. Sorry. Last, last name, name Stacy. Black. Stacy Black. Yep. Um, so. Do you want to just give us a quick... Uh... Yeah, sure. I've known um, Coda since Becky got her as a pup. And my two small kids, who are three and four now, they have, since they were babies, have been around Coda. And I cannot tell you how kind and gentle Coda is with them every single time. She's not snarled at them. She's super awesome. Um, she can get right up when she's chewing a bone. And the kids are right there, and she won't do anything. She's super gentle with them. Um I, her demeanor is awesome. Super trust her. She's a kind, caring dog. Cuddly. I don't think that she needs to be deemed dangerous, in my opinion. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I uh, speak on the matter as well? Uh, certainly. Step up to the mic, please. State your name. Yeah, my name is Sarah Chrysler. Hi. So one matter I want to discuss is uh, I was deemed an agent for the owner of the property to go and take pictures uh, regarding a previous N uh, about cleaning up the backyard. When I got there, uh, the dog Coda was snarling quite vicious at the fence. I actually took some video, which I have on my phone if you need to see. Um, she, Becky came. She was polite at first, got the dog because it was there's no way I could get into the backyard. Uh, when I went into the backyard, I started taking pictures. We had a bit of an altercation. She put her hands on me, uh, and took my phone out of my hand, and threatened to sick her dog on me, which wasn't leashed up. It was actually just by a, a skid held into this little corner, and she was quite belligerent. I had to call the police. Um, I have a report number if you need it, as well as, I think, PAWS, or what I would know as the SPCA. So this was back... Before the fire, the fire actually was about two days after this incident. So, yeah, and when it speaks about the, the fence, she actually put charred, burned out pieces of skid up in some makeshift, you know, barricade, which would not have protected anybody from this dog. And like when she threatened to sick the dog on me, that dog was snarling, frothing at the mouth, vicious, ready to attack. So I had no choice but to call the police. That, that's all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So the next thing here is I'm to ask if there's any uh, uh, participants, if there's any questions for the applicant or the appellant, uh, their witness. Go ahead, Becky, come to the mic, please. <clears throat> My question was for Sarah. Um, this is part of the issue that they are great friends with the people that put in this complaint and have been asked by my landlord to try to do anything to get out to hurt Vicki. That's not true. On the incident that she is talking about, she did come to my house as supposed agent of the landlord um, and said that she couldn't get in the backyard because of my dog that's when she knocked on my door. She had already tried to go in my backyard where the dog was contained. I did not. I have video. Sarah, please, one second. Let Rebecca finish. When she came to my door, I said, okay, give me a second. I brought the dog in the house and then got her to meet me around the gate at the backyard. Um, I did not, it doesn't matter. Like, that's not what this is regarding, but there was no physical altercation between us. Um, and I did not sick my dog on her, like she said. Um, after the dog came in the house and she was in the backyard, um, it was true that we had verbal discussions, um, that weren't very pleasant. Um, but my dog was never, ever a part of that again. Like that's, um, Can I speak on that matter? just one second, uh, Rebecca, are you finished? Sure. All right. Thank you. Would you please uh, sit down and let, uh, Sarah come up to the mic? 
Yeah, I actually have video footage. I did not try to enter that backyard. Um, when I saw that the dog was there snarling and it's like, literally I have the footage if you want to see it to clarify. Um, she did not put the dog into the house. The dog was barricaded in this little tiny rabbit hole cubby uh, with a skid. She did not sick the dog on me. She threatened to sick out the dog on me. She pushed me with her arm, took my cell phone out of my hand, which I was taking the photos with. And then I, I'm like, give me my phone, give me my phone. And she's like, get off my property. So I was extremely like, this is, I'm a, a property manager. That's what I do. I've been one for several years. Um, I, I'm not great friends with Fred or Janie. I've just met them actually. And when they mentioned about another resident and another little girl, that's my niece. She was almost attacked with coral by Coda. This is not the first time. This is several times. This is ridiculous. So yeah, I had to call the police. This was, I, I have my professional hat on. We weren't exchanging nasties. She was the only one acting belligerent and out of tune. I have video, I took pictures. I had no choice but to call the police because I was acting as an agent, as a property manager for this property, which that as of July, that was my hat for this for this property. So, I mean, I take this very seriously. Okay, sir, thank you very much. No so I'm, I'm now going to ask uh, oh. our, sorry, pardon me, Ed, go okay. ahead, uh, right. Councilor Bonovitz. Yes, was, uh, was there any charges there? Uh, they actually spoke with me. Um, they said that had the dog, they actually went and spoke with her. I have the police report. Um, they warned her that if the dog would have actually attacked me, it would have been a criminal charge. Um, they said that if there's another incident, we are going to have to report this with what I thought was the SPCA, but I guess it's something called PAWS. Um, and then also a dangerous dog hearing, which we have today. So these are all matters like steps that we discussed because I actually wanted to have her charged because she put her hands on me, took my property, and then threatened a dog against me, which I do not doubt for one second that the dog would have attacked. And she has been known to uh, threaten to sick the dog on many people. Okay, other questions? Okay, thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask our uh, bylaw officer uh, Forbes uh, for the next statement. I can, I can see why uh, some people would see this dog as, as scary and vicious. It's, it's not a large dog. It's, I would call it more of a medium sized dog. It does have a scary bark. I stood with Rebecca when I, when I uh, issued the order to her, the, uh, the designation and the dog was there beside beside her and never, never growled, never barked, never nothing. But on the other hand, if you try and enter a property when there's a dog present, it may not go well. Um, as for being off the property and attacking another dog, I'm not saying one way or the other, I don't dispute it, but I'm not gonna say it happened either. Um, I'm not sure we need to put all the measures in place, but I think some of them, the dog obviously does have a, a propensity to attack other animals. I'm not, I haven't heard any complaints about it attacking people. I think that would be a whole different discussion here today if it had. So, I know. I, I absolutely agree if, if, if exactly what you said. If it was uh, kids, people, certainly different discussion. So, um, is there other questions here now for our uh, bylaw officer? Or is, uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Dirksen. Thank you, Mayor Turton. Um, just, I think you just said, just want to make sure here, I think you just said that you're not sure if it happened. I wasn't a witness to it, so I can't say yes or no. Okay, and but did, you, I have did had... you see the dog? The Sorry, the dog that was uh, supposedly attacked? I have seen it before, yes. But did you see it with its injuries no. when you... Okay. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Gunson. Three, Mayor Turton. Um, 
So Cam, in the past, when we've deemed dogs dangerous, there's usually like vet bills and, and stuff. Have we ever deemed a dog dangerous for just a single bite one time and we've deemed it dangerous or just yeah, in the past? I'm that was a dog that bit a person and um, I don't know, we, we did have pictures I think of, of the injury, but obviously no vet bill. Um, Hold on for a person, but there hasn't been another one in the past where a dog has attacked another dog and we've deemed that dog dangerous. It's just, there's only been yeah, one other actually, one. Actually there was, there was one, this is probably about five or six years ago now. And there were vet bills were included, pictures, vet bills and whatnot. And the dog was deemed as dangerous, but and they moved out of town so that was the the next municipality she moved into was given the information on that dog thanks any other questions okay uh, go ahead uh, deputy mayor anderson so just to be clear for everybody here when we say the dogs have to be under control what is your expectation if it sounds like the neighbors are letting their dogs run loose as well um, with the premise that they'll stay on their own property um, i'm thinking that's a pretty iffy premise if you got a whole bunch of dogs on the street but what, what are we expecting to technically, see? technically all those dogs would be deemed as as running at large uh, so under control would be fenced in uh, whether it be a, a, a physical fence or an electric fence or on a leash. So long as the dog is on its own property, it's fine to run loose, but right. as soon as it leaves, it's running at large. If you have a way to control it on your property. All right, thank you. Other questions? So, uh, Kim, basically what you've said is you were not a witness to the dog running across the road onto the other person's property, but I mean, you were, you likely weren't the witness, uh, weren't a witness the day the last dog that was deemed dangerous had bit the person, other than the vet bills and a few other things. Kind of, because it was right across the street from the fire hall and we were, I okay. we were doing that day. So you also stated that possibly this dog isn't totally dangerous, but uh, could we come up with a, a list of, of, of uh, a part of the designation? Is that something that you're suggesting or? It's up to council to decide whether the dog is deemed dangerous or not. And it's also up to council to decide which of the, which or all of the provisions are put in place to uh, keep this from happening again. Okay, so in my hand, I've got a list of uh, the purpose of this meeting is to designate this dog, whether it's dangerous, dangerous or not. And if we see fit to uh, deem it a little less dangerous than totally dangerous, is that, uh, there's five, there's one, two, three, four, five, six items on here that, you know, we have to pr definitely protect our, our people and our dogs in this town. And that's, that's, our, that's our job, sorry. So, so there are through you. Um, Go ahead, Emily. There are three different ways you can do this. Um, what you can do is the that it, you affirm the dangerous dog designation as it stands. Um, as you said, Mayor Turton, there are those five, six items um, that were brought forward by Tara Pipers, um, and that's keeping the dog contained within the owner's dwelling or humane shelter, having the dog muzzled when not confined, having a one million dollar liability. Having the dog microchipped to identify it as a dangerous dog, having the property signed to advise the person that there's a dangerous dog, and to advise the animal control officer of any changes of address. So you can amend or change those items, but still hold uh, the affirmation of the dangerous dog designation, or you can revoke the whole dangerous dog uh, designation. That is kind of what's forward to council right now. Okay, so we have uh, deliberated here. Uh, what is your request as council in reference to this <coughs> dangerous dog designation. So we have three choices. Affirm that it is a dangerous dog. Uh, amend the dangerous dog, the five or six items that, or eliminate uh, that is not a dangerous dog. Correct, uh, Clerk McRobb? That's correct. Okay, where are we going with this? Does council wish to look at uh, still holding uh, affirmation of the dangerous dog but changing some of the items or I'm just trying to get you 
to start it here. Sorry? We can recess, yeah. Do we want to take a recess? We certainly can take a recess. And, and uh, what are you suggesting? Uh, I would be able to to make a recess if council wanted to have a few minutes to discuss this. I'll move it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Anderson, all in favor of taking a quick recess. That's carried. Thank you. Open Council. So I'd like a motion, mover, and a seconder to move back into Open Council. Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Zimmerman, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So we've, we've had a, quite a discussion. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, our clerk to uh, read our result. Uh, thank you. Um, we will have a mover and a seconder after I read this out. The Council of the Town of Mitchell affirmed the dangerous dog designation for Appellant Rebecca Palmer. I thought that the order be re uh, amended to remove the requirement for $1 million liability policy in the event of any damage or injury caused by the dog and the removal of the dog microchipping to identify it as a dangerous dog. All other orders would stand. Okay, so can I have a mover and a second, please, for that? Thank I'll you. Move. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Gunson. I have a question for Rebecca. Is the dog microchip presently? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Just let me read my min notes here for a second. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Against, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you guys, uh, all you folks here today, um, respecting each other. That was, that was an excellent meeting. So thank you. And I'm going to adjourn this here hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody want to give up your chair? Is there other folks in the hallway? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move right into our third public meeting. Um, Matthew, would you mind just closing that door? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we close that door if, uh, if you don't mind. All right, we're going to continue on into the engineering report section, the 78 uh, drainage act, municipal drain number 102. I'm going to uh, chair this public meeting. And I'm going to ask uh, Clerk McRobb to outline the purpose of the meeting. Um, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to consider the engineering report prepared by R.J. Burnside and Associate Limited, dated October 20th, 2022, for drain number 102. Notices of the meeting were sent to town landowners, along with copies of the report uh, were circulated to town staff, Ministry of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs, Mainland Valley Conservation Authority, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Um, I can advise that I did not have any uh, speakers registered, although we did receive a letter from Antonio uh, Andretti. Um, he is not able to be here. Um, I can read his letter out. Uh, it was not attached. It's that he feels that charges for the Minto Drain 102 are excessive for an outlet that I have already paid for once. It doesn't add any benefit for my land which is mostly uh, bush draining in there. And I believe that may be something that would come forward at the quarter provision. Okay. Thank you, Clerk McRobb. I'd like to ask Mr. Greg Manskeville from the RJ Burnside to give his summary of his report. Welcome, Greg. I don't know when the last time you were in this council chambers, but you're always welcome, so go ahead. Thank you very much. It's very good to be back. I think it's been a couple of years now. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Mayor Turton, um, members of council, staff. Uh, I'd like to start tonight uh, with a couple of introductions. Um, I'm Greg Nanskeville. A lot of you know me. Perhaps some of the new folks don't. Um, and we have Trevor Kipfer, uh, professional engineer with RJ Burnside. And we have um, Edison or Eddie Peel, an engineer in training, also with RJ Burnside. And these guys have put a lot of work into preparing this report. Um, today I'll be presenting the Minto Drain 102 Improvement Report on behalf of R.J. Burnside and Associates for your consideration. Um, I trust you've all had a uh, chance and received a copy of this report and hopefully have had a chance to review it somewhat. And in the uh, idea of keeping time 
kind of on track. My uh, overview will be very brief. If you have any questions, please feel free to answer them, or please feel free to ask them. <laughs> 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 and if I haven't got the answer, maybe one of these two do. Um, R.J. Burnside was appointed by Mental Council to prepare a drainage report under Section 78 of the Drainage Act for repairs and improvements to Drain 102. Um, drain 102 was originally constructed under a report prepared by uh, J.R. Spriat and Associates. Um, that was in 1987. This drainage system services um, if you turn to Appendix H, there's a plan view, which will show you the, the watershed area and the lots that it serves. And it serves parts of lots 40 and 41 in concession five, parts of lots 40 to 42 in concession six, parts of lots 39 to 41 in concession seven, and part of lot 40 in concession eight, all within the town of Minto. And this is very near the uh, border with Howick Township. The revised watershed in this report is approximately 216 hectares, which is roughly 533 acres. Uh, we had an on-site meeting that was held March 11th, 2022, and it was held here in Harriston in the old uh, railway station. A hydraulic, a hydrologic and hydraulic model was created using Swim Heimel um, for this system to determine the uh, peak flows for different different storms, different return events. And for this one, um, we actually got the peak flows for the watershed for the two, five, 10, 25, 50, and 100 year storm events. A closed circuit television system, or camera, uh, investigation was done on the tile portion of the drain. And the um, condition was found to be generally a fair condition of the tile. That tile was designed to a half inch drainage coefficient which is not up to today's standards, but um, the local fellows figured it would be pretty good for now, for now anyway. Um, an information meeting was held, once again, at the old railway station in Harrison on July 21st, 2022. And the works proposed under this report, um, there's a little bit of work on the catch basin to be done on the north side of uh, the seventh line and a large rock to be removed from inside the tile. Uh, 279 meters, or about 915 feet, of open channel cleanout. Approximately 375 meters, or 1,230 feet, of open ditch deepening and widening. Uh, the replacement of a 1,600 millimeter, or basically a five-foot culvert, um, with an 1,800 millimeter diameter, or six-foot culvert, um, on Bride Road to be replaced. Allowances have been provided if you look at uh, Appendix A in the report. And uh, they have been provided for Sections 29 for right-of-way and for Section 30 damages to um, crops and lands. Total allowances provided for under this report total $7,100. Estimated construction costs can be found in Appendix B of this report. And estimated construction costs are $80,600. Total engineering, $32,000. CCTV camera investigation, $2,100. Other administration and financing, $8,200. For total estimated cost of this project as presented here today of $130,000. <coughs> If you turn to Appendix C1, you can see the, the assessment of these costs. And if you turn to C1, you'll see um, municipal lands have been assessed $18,010. Privately owned agricultural lands have been assessed $70,110. Privately owned non-agricultural lands, $730. Special assessments on Bride Line, $34,150. So if you want to look at that in terms of percentages, um, municipal lands and roads, 14% of the total cost of the project. Privately owned agricultural lands, 59% of the total project. 
privately owned non-agricultural, 6% <laughs> of the total project, and then special assessment at 26%. A summary of the um, assessments and allowances, and as well as the grants uh, provided for are found in a, in a loose page um, that has some red columns on it. I believe it's loose in your files. It looks something, something like that. And there we've done a summary of um, the, actual, uh, the actual assessments. We've deducted any grants that are applicable. We've deducted any allowances were provided and provided a net column or basically an out-of-pocket uh, cost column for the individual properties being assessed. So now if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. But if I can't, probably Trevor or Eddie can. Questions from Council? Councillor Dirksen. Thank you, Mayor Turton. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, first one is maybe tongue in cheek, but why are on site meetings not held on site anymore? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> in the Drainage Act, that is actually a, a term that actually refers to certain actions that should take place at that meeting. And just in the light of COVID and some basic um, actual personal experiences, I find it's not always safest to have, you know, um, people congregated at the side of a road having a meeting, kind of like an auction sale. Um, we have had incidents happen. And then with COVID, we found, you know what, maybe we don't have to get together and stand there. We can go indoors where there's no wind blowing around and that type of thing. So that's why. Okay, perfect. And um, you'd mentioned, well, there was a picture in, in this vast document somewhere um, of a rock. Uh, stuck in a tile. How does that happen? Would that be something like did, did that take a human to make that happen or? I'm not going to say that, but. Or, uh, well, would it take, would it take quite a rush of water to make that happen? Well, there's a grate on that catch basin that that rock won't fit through. So I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay. And it's a question. Thank you. Okay. So you can make some assumptions. Any other questions? So, Greg, the two meetings, March 11th and uh, the one in August, I believe, were very productive meetings. Uh, no serious issues on, on this uh, drainage uh, system. That's correct. Yep. Okay. This, this actually started um, as a little bit bigger project, and now it's been split into two, but we'll get to part two maybe after Christmas. M maybe? After Christmas. Okay. Not today. Not today. Okay. So... Any, sorry, Councillor Dirksen, you have another question? Um, so I did receive some phone calls on this, and I think maybe even received a letter on it, I'm not sure. And I think maybe there were some other conversations with other councillors. Were all of those um, concerns addressed and resolved to your understanding? I believe so for, for this part of the project. For, for this, yeah, at right. this, pro, at this uh, spot. Right. Okay, thank you. So for you, Chair Turton, I do see that there are people at the back that may be here for the meeting. I'm not sure if they wish to speak as well. Okay. So the next line here. So Greg, you're finished. Did you yep. take a break? You'll take questions in a moment. Yep. Um, any speakers registered to participate and wishing to provide information that might influence the council's decision on the matter? And there's been nobody registered, but we'll give anybody that wants to take a moment and speak right now. Any questions for uh, uh, Greg? Okay, hearing none then, uh, we go to the next line here. Um, questions from council, I think that's already finished. Okay, so I'm gonna state that the council must decide whether or not to proceed with the project by provisionally adopting the engineer's report by bylaw or referring the report back to the engineer for modifications. There is no right to appeal assessments or other aspects of the engineer's report at this meeting. These, these appeal, rights will be made available later in the procedure. So I'm going to ask Clerk McGraw to uh, uh, note the bylaw and present it in open council. That's correct, there will that's be a bylaw. What, if that's what council wishes. Okay. That's the route we're going, then we'll uh, look at the bylaw later. Okay. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to officially adjourn the meeting. 
um, considering that the engineer's report drain 102. So thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Thank you other gentlemen for coming this afternoon and anybody pertaining to drain 102. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry it took so long. That's four, uh, that's one hour and 21 minutes. You could have been. Forget about it. <laughs> so saying all that, we're moving right along. We're into the next public meeting. And we thank you gentlemen for your patience today. So this is ZBA 2022-06-9810 Baseline Road. I'm going to act as chairman of this public meeting. And I'm going to ask uh, Clerk McRobb. Uh, sorry, first thing, I want to make sure everybody's signed in, and uh, I'm going to state the following. If a person or public body does not make an oral submission at a public meeting or make written submissions to the town of Minto before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the town of Minto to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party of, to the hearing of the appeal before the tribunal unless... In the opinion of the board, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So I'm going to ask Clerk McRobb to state the municipal address and the legal, legal description. Uh, thank you, Mayor Turton. The property subject to the proposed amendment is located on part lot 12 and part lot 13, concession 17, with a municipal address of 9810 Baseline Road in the town of Minto. The subject property is approximately 39.7 hectare or 98 acres in size. The purpose and effect of the proposed amendment is to rezone a portion of the subject lands to permit a church and cemetery and address minimum distance separation one, MDS one setbacks from the existing livestock operations on the subject lands. The property is currently zoned agriculture. Additional relief may be considered at this meeting. The notices were mailed to the property owners within 400 feet or 120 meters of the subject property, as well as the applicable agencies and posted on the subject property on November 14th, 2022. Uh, reports and comments have been received and were attached for council's review, which is from the Wellington County Planners, the Town of Mento Planning Coordinator, uh, Sogging uh, Conservation Authority, and that is all I have. And we do have people that are coming on for this meeting. So, next step here is to ask our uh, County Planner, uh, Matthew Dawu, to provide comments regarding the proposed amendment the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw number 08186. Perfect, thank you and through you Chair. Uh, before you today is a zoning bylaw amendment seeking to rezone a portion of subject land from agricultural to agricultural site specific. Uh, the applicant is seeking the aforementioned amendment to facilitate the construction of a new rural church and cemetery on the subject lands. Planning staff note that the subject lands are designated as secondary agricultural in the county official plan. And section 6.4.9 of the plan permits communities, community services facilities. Um, and this includes churches and cemeteries for local communities to provide on horse-drawn vehicles as their sole means of transportation. Uh, lastly, planning staff note that the proposed new use does not meet MDS requirements to the existing barns um, on the 9810 Baseline Road, which are the applicant's uh, farms. The bylaw has been prepared for council's consideration this, uh, this evening, um, which would address the MDS issue and limit the use to only a rural church and cemetery. Uh, and with that said, planning staff are satisfied with the application and are supportive of the rezoning, and I welcome any questions. So, Matthew, thank you. What we'll do is uh, come to the questions in a moment. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ashley Sawyer, uh, Town of Minto's Planning Coordinator, to give some comments. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mayor Turton. Uh, so just to add on there, we did receive comments from Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority that they, are, um, they have no concerns with the proposal. Uh, it's consistent with the provincial policy statement and local planning policy um, has been applied as well. Uh, Town of Minto staff, we are in support of the application as we are also of the opinion that it's consistent with the County of Wellington's official plan and applicable policies. Um, our Public Works Department did provide some comments, um, so the applicants will be required to obtain an entrance permit um, from our Roads and Drainage Manager. That's a separate process from a zoning bylaw amendment, um, but it is still required. Um, access from given road is what is proposed and preferable. 
um, and town staff are satisfied that a suitable driveway location can be determined. Uh, we're not necessarily in favor of the 160 foot driveway shown on the site sketch, but we are satisfied that we can come up with a solution that works for everyone. Um, and uh, the driveways may require culverts, which would be required to be built to the town's uh, servicing and design standards. Additionally, the site development and grading needs to maintain a roadside ditch. Um, and as I mentioned, this will be addressed separately from the zoning, but we did want to provide comments and we have spoke to Elvin already, so he is aware. Thank you, Ashley. Now I'm going to ask uh, Elvin Martin, uh, the applicant, to step up to the mic, please. I never asked these other folks to step up to the mic because they have one with them, so. Elvin, welcome to Elvin the meeting today. Martin is my name. Thank you, Jordan. And we, um, I think I'm satisfied with the statements that were made for the application. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody here for, for what you are doing for the town. Um, so for their, I don't think I have a lot to say. Okay, fine. Thank you. So what we'll do now is we'll have questions from council. If you, if you don't mind staying there, Alvin, in case there's a question for you, go ahead. Uh, Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, my question is about the MDS. Right now, we're having a problem because they're all quite close to the MDS, or, or, or the people here. But what happens if the properties change ownership? A new person comes in, they challenge that MDS. Matthew, you want to take that on? Thank sure, you. Yeah, so through you, Chair, the in the bylaws directly written that MD, any NDS conflicts with the proposed use is essentially null and void. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? <laughs> Councillor Dirksen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Church. Um, will this property be um, severed or will it just continue to be the full property? Uh, yes, we are working to do a severance. Okay. I think that's on the application. Thank you. Councillor Potman, it's Mr. Uh, Mayor Jordan. Um, is there not, um, any consideration to put a school on this property as well, or just the church and the cemetery? Just the church and the cemetery is correct, yes. And I guess question for a building, is there a site plan control applicable here? Um, at, thi at this moment, yes, but we're looking at amending the site plan uh, to eliminate some rural needs. Other questions? Okay. Seeing none, then I'm going to ask uh, if Quinn would turn on the Zoom to uh, 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 one of the neighbors, Carrie Wedham. She's a neighboring landowner. And I'm not sure whether. I think that's her up in the corner. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, Carrie, welcome. Welcome to the meeting today. Thank uh, you. Can you see, uh, you can see what's going on here, the people and everything? Yes, I can. Okay, then uh, you're on, Carrie, go ahead. Okay, um, in the beginning when we started this, um, a couple gentlemen uh, came to my door and asked me if there, I had a problem with them building a small church on the, the hill uh, at the end of the property, not on the farthest end of the property not uh, like it was on Gibbon Road, not the end near Baseline Road. Uh, two gentlemen came anyways and asked me if I would have a problem with them building a small church. And I said, no, I wouldn't. Uh, then they came back about a month later and um, asked me if I had any problem with them building a church down there a small church app off a of baseline and given road like that corner and at the time I thought it was going to be a small church so I said no when when they came nobody mentioned a cemetery at all and so I never thought anything more of it until I got the letter when I got the letter I went into the township office and although the letter was provided, and I'm not criticizing anybody, but I'm not sure why uh, their proposal that they gave them wasn't sent out to the neighbors, 
because when I went into the township, they gave me their site plan of where they were going to build what, how many feet, blah, blah, blah. Um, in having said that, the site plan is allows for a 160 foot driveway, which I just built a new home and it goes from one end of my property to quite a few feet past the end of my property. And I have a three acre property across the road, which I just built a new house on. Um, and it was then that I kind of realized that there was, well, it was in the letter, but then I realized where they were building or their site plan for the building property for the cemetery. Um, at the time, I wasn't concerned when it was a small church up in the corner, the other corner. It, but now that it's going to be, they changed it because they spoke to a neighbor. Um, I don't know his name. He works on, he has Shamadon Farm on the next side road, but he owns the farm, the farmland that butts against the farmland that I'm, that they're trying to get the, uh, severance for as well as the amendment to the um the zoning i at this point because now everything is right across the road from me including uh i wouldn't call it a small church it's a 4200 foot church which is going to be directly across from me and the other 124 feet that goes up to the site to the end of the church has got one, two, three, three rows of 150 foot of um, chains for the horses. Behind it, it has, the church has another 190 foot of chain for horses. And then on the other side of the church, it has 182 feet uh, double-sided to the road on the furthest end of the property, 595. I don't know if you guys are looking at what I'm looking at, uh, if you have the little site map. Um, I'm looking at it. Uh, is anybody? Oh, looking? okay. Everybody has seen it. Yes. Oh, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so now I have many concerns because I have a dug well and I just built a new home. And for sure it's going to affect my water uh, with the amount of horses and stuff that's going in there and the amount of horse excrement as well as many other factors as soon as they kind of disturb the land because I have a dug well it definitely is going to affect my water uh, on top of that I spoke with a real estate agent who told me that it would devalue the price of my property considerably um, it's a non-maintenance winter road, which is very narrow. Um, so to bring uh, like 150 or 100 horses and buggies in there on a weekly basis, just the, pardon my language, but the horse alone is going to be major. And I don't know if they're going to clean it up every week, but I highly doubt it. Um, uh, what else? The driveway is a huge thing for me because the 160 feet goes from right across my property, like the whole property plus more for a driveway. And it's like, I, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure why they need that sort of a driveway, but at the same time, yeah. <laughs> And I was wondering if, the other thing is to me, it's kind of, and I'm not saying it's a waste because it's a church and a cemetery, but I'm not sure that it's a good um, use of good farmland to take it out and to do what they're, they want to do. Uh, I know they did it on 10th line, but they did it on an existing piece of property where there was a school beside it and they took the corner off it. So, uh, and it's on a, the corner of two concessions. I think it's uh, concession 10 and Pike Lake Road. 
but it doesn't affect anybody that's residential because there's nobody around there. Whereas here where I am, um, I just built here, um, my neighbor up the road, Daryl Lee, who's also gonna speak next, it affects his land. And the gentleman on the corner, which is uh, Chris Getke, uh, put in for a severance for a piece of property to sell one acre of his land. And unfortunately for them, they didn't know that there was a cemetery going in. They thought it was a small church as well. So they didn't do anything, but I did go speak with them last night and they are definitely not for it anymore with the 160 foot driveway and the cemetery attached to it. And specifically because they also have a dug well and you just gave them the severance and they don't believe that they'll be able to sell the property with a cemetery across the road as well as 150 parking spaces for horses as well as a church. Um, I was wondering if they could tell me how many proposed um, like horse hookups that they're looking at. Okay, so Gary, th thank you for the questions. And uh, I mean, we likely can answer some of them here today. Uh, Okay. Um, so I did, I tried to list some of your questions and, and so I will uh, go through them, I guess, if that's okay. Clerk, make, make yes. yes. Okay. So the size of the church, 4,200 square feet, is that accurate? Yeah. Well, I don't know what came Gary, to Gary, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've got three gentlemen here that are going to, sorry, two gentlemen and a young lady that are going to answer these questions. So. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> so, Ellen, the floor is yours. Can you, can, and I mean, anybody can jump in here when you want to answer these questions. I guess I don't have a drawing or a sketch with me today, but I, I think that's correct. So I can certainly address some of the questions okay. if you'd like me to now, or if you'd like um, Daryl to you, speak first, then that's... Did you uh, write the questions down? Most of them, yes. So, okay. <laughs> so then that'd be perfect. Do you want yeah. to take the, take the floor then? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the site Carrie, sketch... can you hear Ashley? Yes. She okay. Can. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of the site sketch not being included in the notice, um, it does state on the notice that it's available um, for your inspection at the town office. Yeah. And so that's where... Um, it was provided. Um, the driveway location, as I mentioned, um, were preferable that it's off given road. Um, that's a separate process. This is just a site sketch to illustrate the proposal, um, but they still will have to obtain an entrance permit from our roads and drainage manager. Um, and like I said, we're not, I'm not going to say we're 110% against 160 foot, but right now that's not the direction we're going, but we are satisfied that we can work with the applicants and find something that works for everyone, including town staff, but that's ultimately up to our roads and drainage manager to permit that. Um, as for the church attendance, I've been told it will be bi-weekly. Um, and then in terms of policy, it does meet that, being it is a secondary agricultural zone as well. Um, this would also be permitted, I believe, in prime agricultural. Um, and it's in the official plan and provincial policy as well. So we act in accordance with the policies that we have to. Um, in terms of water quality, I'll let Terry touch on that. Perfect. Um, so in terms of water quality from the horses that will be uh, housed there temporarily, um, it won't impact um, any of the local wells uh, in that area. If you think about it, it would be probably less amount of nutrients being generated or placed there than if the cultivate, cultivated field uh, manure was applied to it. Um, mm -hmm. So... The other thing with respect to the cemetery impacting water quality, I have never heard of that being the case. Um, there is no setback uh, in the building code or I don't believe in the EPA for the distance from a well to uh, a cemetery. Um, prime example, we have a, a town well that's drilled within our own cemetery. So I, don't, uh, I haven't heard that that would cause an issue. And I think that was all. Okay. Sorry, the other thing I did want to mention, um, as Carrie did say, uh, it is a very narrow road. 
Um, the original road allowance there is only 33 feet wide, so it's like the asphalted width of a normal street. Um, yeah. The preference from a safety perspective to have the church located uh, at the corner of baseline and given is preferred. Um, otherwise, they're going to have to be traveling further up uh, given road, which is which is really narrow. Mm -hmm. um, the road uh, is maintained in the wintertime. Um, they do turn around, I believe, in your uh, uh, driveway, Ryan. Um, so it is a winter maintained road. Um, and that's, yeah, that is all I wanted to clarify. One other question that I had was the uh, manure cleanup. Is that is that an issue or? Um, no, it, it's just naturally yep. um, composted or whatever. It's not, it is not cleaned up. And I don't know when this fits in, but that's one question we had when we got notice of more people being here. And we apologize. Um, for not mentioning the cemetery, it was not not intentional. It was not our intent to mislead someone. We, I think, we just more like in our settings are so used to having a church and cemetery, we didn't think to mention it. So we apologize for that. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Councillor Podimitz. Yeah, you uh, Is this the only site that you've looked at, or are there other, have there been other suitable? Uh, sites that uh, would not affect neighbors as much looked at or there have been a few spots there's no other spot that we applied like did an application for um but the inspector dave wilson and um road superintendent mike mcisaac were out a few different times i guess which was up at at the woodlot which is just on the other end of the property back at the bush on Given Road. And we were also on the 16th line, which would be at the very opposite end of, of this farm property. And their preference was to not have it there because with the road, has quite a slope coming down from the east side. So I guess those were kind of the three we were looking at in Minto all within that or on that far property it would have been three different okay and it does that uh, satisfy you other questions the tie-ups uh, for the horses i think uh, um i heard a 150 buggy, buggies uh, bi-weekly, is that uh, a fair estimate? Not that it really matters, but... I might have to lean on the others for that okay. estimate because it's going to be an estimate. It's an estimate. Okay. Um, so would, would you mind uh, just taking up to the mic or relay to your to <laughs> Alvin? He'll, uh, he'll speak into the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, and thanks everybody for giving us the opportunity. Um, so my name is Mervyn Weber, and we're just all kind of um, as one group here proposing this. And I agree 100% with what Elvin had said about the cemetery part did get missed. And we do apologize for that. I think we're all on the same page there. As far as horse tie-ups, that could vary um, tremendously from one week to the next. We don't necessarily have invitations coming to the church specifically. It's a free, free, free for or like it's a. It'll vary for one week to the next. As far as a hundred tie-ups, it could be more than that. Some days it could be half that. Some some Sundays, there's some Sundays that there's no one there. It's just the way our schedules work. Sometimes we have church there and sometimes not. So, and on an average, it could be a hundred. There's some days it could be more, but there's definitely days going to be likely less than that as well. Okay. Mayor Turton. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor. Yes, for you, Mayor Turton. Uh, you had mentioned that you had looked at other sites. Would it be possible to provide Council with information similar to this on the suitability of those sites? I just want to make, make sure that, that 
you're not affecting neighbors or, or you know, obviously there are some concerns here. I'm sure we could provide the information there. The only reason we moved down was because of another neighbor proposing maybe building a retirement home in that woodlot. Okay. So instead of just, you know, denying the fact that he asked something of us, we just moved down there and tried that. And being we missed mentioning something, we actually kind of got it this far with how it is now. Ashley, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to add, um, in conversations with our deputy CBO and our roads and drainage manager, they did discuss and explore other options. This was deemed as the um, most suitable. Um, so they certainly have done their due diligence. They've, in my opinion, tried to work with neighbors as much as possible to come up with a suitable location and to appease everyone, but it's not always possible. Go ahead, sir. And I'd definitely like to mention that I haven't met Kerry. I wasn't one of the gentlemen there, but I definitely would like to try and, and I think we'd all agree with that, um, try and make something work for all of us. Um, could we meet with her? Should we meet with her again on a private note um, for a proposal on something that would, would work for all of us? As far as the cemetery, we, I was thinking maybe, you know, if we, would it help if we'd conceal it with trees that it's not visible from her, her window? Um, as far as the church building size, I'm afraid we can't really do much there to accommodate that many horse tie-ups obviously brings a lot of people as well. And that's what we're doing. And with growth in the community, that's the reason for the proposal. Um, so having said all that, we certainly don't want to push it harder on someone that we, you know, we don't want opposition to the point that we're just pushing our way through, but we definitely would be willing to work with with Carrie, see what we could come up with to make it work for everyone. Okay, um, so I think we have one more speaker, correct? That's correct, Daryl Lee. Um, so, I know that he's there with oh, okay, Carrie, Darryl. and so if Daryl wanted to come on, and I'm not sure if it's unmuted then now, and good to go. Welcome, Daryl. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Um, you guys pretty well answered all the questions. <laughs> um, but my main concern as well was the width of the road with more traffic. And it's narrow because of the width of it and whatnot, right? That was one of my most concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? I actually have a question. Uh, okay. May I ask a question? May yeah, I ask? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, when he says there's like 150 buggies or there's 150 hookups or 100 hookups and know that the manure will just go naturally compost, uh, put yourself in my position where uh, every time they go in and out of that driveway with even their tractors spreading pig manure or liquid pig manure, uh, the smell is atrocious for two or three days. Uh, the pig, the horse manure doesn't smell, obviously, is bad, but they're not going to stop putting pig manure on. But if you had 150 horses a week and half of them had to uh, dispel their excrement, uh, would you like to live on a road and go, oh, well, right across my driveway is uh, 75 horses just took a dump and it it will naturally compose in how long? So I'm supposed to drive on that road now that's full of horse crap. Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't think that maybe they're looking at the big picture here because even the gentleman on the property next to me who unfortunately couldn't be here, but I did speak with him. His name is Chris Getty. Um, he feels his property will never sell now and he just got the severance because it's right across the road he's right beside me he severed the property he paid the money whatever and now with this property changing its whole whatever it, like the whole idea of what was going in there was a small church is a whole lot different than a large church and 150 buggies and i know that you, you know they're saying well, it's only going to be used every other week. There's no guarantee if you're building a church of that size 
that you're only going to get to you or they're only going to use it every other week. It's partly because they have a pastor from Drayton who they don't have one now for here that can only do it every other week. That doesn't mean in six months that it's going to be every Sunday that there's going to be a hundred horses across the road. And I don't have a beef with any person on this earth, but when it affects me, um, I don't, yeah, then I do have a beef. And I don't agree with the thing about the horse manure. I don't agree that it's not gonna affect my water because it already has from his farm. And I actually have tests to show it that my water is not drinkable because of the bacteria. And it was fine when I moved in, but it's not fine anymore. So Carrie? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is it appropriate for you to meet yeah. with these young, young men and women and uh, come up with some sort of discussion point, uh, you and Daryl? Um, is it possible for them? Yeah, we could, okay. for sure. Likely, I'm not opposed to that. But Carrie? in having said that, yeah. Okay. Uh, we could, so. but can, could I just ask you a question? Could we ask Chris Getke as well? Uh, I would think, do you guys have any problems with Chris Getke being a part? No, so because uh, I, think these, I think we've got some flexibility here and Terry, Ashley, okay. Matthew. Are we okay with, uh, can you chair the meeting or? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is that a fair compromise? That is a fair compromise, but okay. I just want to make one more comment. If one they more. were on the other side of um, the farm, which is by the pig barn, if they put it there, the only people that it's going to affect is the owner of the proper pet presently and his brother because that's where it would be across the road from them because it's their farm okay so, so basically then these at another site are uh we'll likely look at that if that's okay. something that we can look at or ellen do you want to speak to that um just more of a clarification so are you, Kerry, referring to, like, is there a 40-acre lot right at the front corner across from the home farm that actually belongs to the farm south of the 16th? Yeah. Like, if I think right up in the corner, which I think you're referring to. Yeah, we're from Florence and... Um, Floyd, Floyd. Oh, sorry, Floyd and Lawrence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my question is, um, like right up at the corner of the 16th and baseline is actually a part of the Braun farm, if I'm correct? Um, I'm not sure. I was, from what I know, uh, Floyd's property or possibly Lawrence's, I'm not sure, also goes on the other side of his hog barn. Is that not correct? Yes, yes, you are correct. Like it comes out at the bottom of that hill, I think. So yes, at, which is on six. No, not six. Sixteen. It's the it's the corner right past the it's the corner right at the end of their farm. Yeah, right across from Floyd's farm. That's correct. Yes, um, that would be a preferable spot, but it's I think that is owned by the Alan Brown farm. Oh, okay. I don't know that. I, I, I'm not going to do it. So, so that would that'd be our reason. Or we, we would actually prefer on the 16th, but yeah. But no, just for clarification. Okay. okay. Well, maybe something we could look into or we could talk. Possible. Sure. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put an end to the meeting here and I'm going to uh, ask Terry, Ashley to coordinate a meeting between the two or three landowners and yourselves. Uh, okay. Are we okay with that? And so we'll take our uh, direction from our chief building official in reference to this meeting, where it's going to be and when it is. Okay. Okay. 
So Well, but we have to look at that one by law contract. So okay. right now this is just it. Council and then we Okay. So council, any further opportunities to speak here? Sorry. Go ahead, Councilor Bodnitz. I, I, I know I'm speaking a lot, but I just was doing some math here, and based on something I heard here, there's 150 buggy potential on that site. Uh, you put two people per buggy. Do the math on that, and then there's probably going to be kids and whatever else. Is that building going to be large enough? Sorry. Is that building going to be large enough to accommodate? Um, trying to think of the size of the church by Greenbush. I think it's a little bit, a little bit larger. And you could potentially have, well, 300 plus. That's just counting two people per buggy. Mm -hmm. So the, the purpose of the meeting today would just be to get the uses put in place, not necessarily dealing with the site development. Um, so I think that's what we're setting up the meeting with, okay. with Carrie and, and Daryl. And sorry, I forget the other, Chris. Um, so. So is that uh, something that we're going to, what's the urgency uh, on this? Do we do it before Christmas or after? It, it just changes the zoning by passing the bylaw and there would still be site specific items to go through yet. Okay. So, all right. Okay, Terry, we got direction. All right. Sorry. Go ahead, Matthew. You don't mind me just adding a point there. The site specific zoning is going on one specific location on the property. Um, so by approving it today, you're essentially agreeing it's going in this spot. I just want to add that point of clarification. <coughs> okay. So we have a bylaw today that if we do approve it, it'll be a site specific bylaw. So we're going to defer that bylaw until after the meeting. Okay. So we are right. deferring it during the open session. Okay. Yep. So everybody agree? Perfect. So I agree. Okay. So uh, no, no further comments then I'm going to uh, adjourn this public meeting. So again, uh, thank, thank you for your participation, okay. Gary, and, and uh, uh, you'll take your direction from Terry when the time comes. Okay, right. thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And if you gentlemen want to stay for uh, a while, I'm, and we apologize for signing up. I'd like a motion to move the delegation up in our agenda. Thank you, Councillor Gunson. Thank you, Councillor Dirksen. So this afternoon, our, uh, sorry, all in favor of that uh, motion? Should have done that two hours ago. Yes, Mr. we Mayor. should have. <laughs> so this afternoon, ladies, we have a uh, uh, delegation from the Senior Center of Excellence. And uh, Helen is uh, would you be your spokesperson, please? Come up to the mic and, and state your name. Uh, Helen Edwards, and I am the coordinator from the Senior Center for Excellence. And we put together a little presentation for you. Um, unfortunately, one of our um, deleg the delegation had to leave because we didn't realize how much controversy there is in the town of Minto. So he had an, he had a, um, an appointment at 4.30, so. Well, I'd um, like to clarify one thing. Yeah, what's that? These are the times and the places to have the discussions on these. I don't think there was a huge controversy, but it was definitely- It was very interesting. Dialogue, so. Yes, okay. Well, that that's fine, yes, okay. So um, we're here. Um, uh, to ask uh, that council consider um, matching the donation that the Township of Mapleton has made to the Senior Center for Excellence um, to keep our um, uh, ACE coordinator position running. And the ACE coordinator stands for Active, Connected, 
and engaged. And um, I, I jotted down some of the responsibilities here of the, of the ACE coordinator. And so she facilitates two Zoom sessions per week, which are open to anyone. Um, she creates, monitors, and responds to our Facebook page and also posts things on um, what's happening pages, things that are of um, interest to seniors. Um, and she creates our monthly Senior Center for Excellence newsletter, which I believe you guys receive each month. And um, she's really been responsible. She is an author and publisher. So she's really taken what was a two page, uh, two sided one sheet to um, a, a four page double sided publication. And one of the seniors uh, described that uh, publication as receiving a letter from a friend in the mail or a magazine subscription. So I know how that feels when you receive either of those. So that's a pretty nice quote from a senior. So if I could get you to move to the next page, please. So this is just an example of some of our Facebook page posts. So we have a few things that we like to put out there around safety for seniors. So we, November was Falls Prevention Month. So uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the very best way to walk is like a penguin when it's slippery. So um, we like to get those messages out to seniors and really anyone that doesn't like falling. And um, we also uh, are working on a stocking project right now where we've raised about $3,500 for seniors who are living alone, isolated in the community, and we'll be delivering uh, Christmas stockings to them. And one of the posts there is our um, building um, community resiliency campaigns where we're um, putting out a call to action to the greater community because we really feel that um, it's beyond the healthcare system to, uh, to take care of people. We need to take care of our neighbors and people in our community that are vulnerable. So, um, and we also have a Thoughtful Thursday uh, prize each week where we promote local business. And so if I could get the next slide, please. Um, so what we, um, what we know about our Zoom sessions is that when we did a town hall, that 100% of the seniors who took part want the programming to continue and feel it's important post pandemic. That, um, and it was an anonymous poll, so people could be honest. 100% um, of the seniors indicated, um, yes, that they wanted it to continue and that it helped them to feel more connected to their community and to their peers. And we know through research that seniors who are more connected to their community are more likely to report their health as good. And seniors who have high, a higher integration within their community, um, that has been associated with a delay, uh, delayed memory in memory loss. So it's very, very important to seniors to remain um, connected. And living in the rural area, there are several barriers to attending in-person events, not, not just the weather, but mobility issues and the lack of transportation. Um, and this is just a little bit about the Senior Center. This is our stats from 2021. So um, a person can only be an individual served once, but they can attend multiple events. So we provided services to 869 individuals um, with just over 8,000 in-person and virtual visits. And just a little bit about our newsletter. It's 250 paper copies and more than 300 electronic copies are distributed each month. And I hope you had a chance to read these quotes from our seniors because I don't want to take the time. I know it's been a busy meeting to read them out to you. And also we have our two uh, members of the delegation. And so I am going to ask um, Ruth Wilson to come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor. Welcome, Ruth. And the Councillors and everybody else. I'm uh, Ruth Wilson. And I'm a senior, and I'm very happy to say that I have been a part of the Seniors for Excellence program that Helen started some about 14 years ago. It became such a successful um, program that she had to get additional staff, and still more uh, seniors kept 
uh, calling and, and responding. So uh, she had to get still some more staff. Uh, all these seniors are from Minto, Mapleton and North Wellington. So this new position of ACE was created and filled by a very capable, knowledgeable and hardworking Glennis Billick. And this is the reason that we are here today. The funding available to employ Glennis has run out. And unless we get added funds, we're going to lose her. As nice and hardworking as she is, we can't expect her to work a full-time uh, day's job on volunteers' pay. So we are asking you, the, the Mental Council, for $10,000 from your budget to keep a lot of seniors happy. Why, you ask? Well, when COVID raised its ugly head, um, the seniors were told, don't go out, stay in. You're going to get sick. Um, and the way that the seniors were passing away in the care homes and the hospitals, it frightened all of us. So we really did stay in. Some people were bored. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have too many visitors. And that's when this um, Zoom uh, program came. Glennis, with help, developed this Zoom twice weekly session for us to connect to. And well, we had actual faces coming into our uh, living rooms, dens, whatever, and we didn't have any fear of catching COVID from the faces on the screen. We had professionals from healthcare come and give us advice and help clear our fears, answer our questions, as did uh, pharmacists and nutritionists. To keep us from becoming couch potatoes, because we're locked in, we were shown how to and encouraged to do many exercises, some of which could be done at your kitchen sink while you were doing the dishes. And without packing up a suitcase or leaving home, um, we visited England, Scotland, Ireland, France, Italy, seeing all the uh, top tourist attractions, Big Ben, castles, ruins, museums, galleries, the Leaning Tower of Pizza, Kissing Stone of Ireland, all on that screen in front of us, courtesy of pictures taken by seniors who had made these trips previously. Other seniors took us to many interesting places in all parts of Canada, the Arctic. One of my favorite uh, Zoom sessions was the uh, Seniors Antique Car Club, who dipped their front wheels in the Pacific Ocean, drove right across Canada, dipped their rear wheels in the Atlantic Ocean. Think of what fun 40 cars had going down there. There were breakups, breakdowns and whatever, but it was one of the best sessions that we had, that I think. Um, we have gotten to know so many of our seniors better because some of the sessions are called A Day in the Life of, and we, Helen would pick up, uh, Glennis would pick somebody, and they would tell us in words and pictures their whole life story. There are really some quite remarkable people out there. Do you really know your elderly next door neighbor? I could go on and on, but I've used up my time and I can't tell you how much I do like these Zoom um, sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I really look forward to the, those days as I'm sure a lot of the other seniors do. In conclusion, I sincerely ask Council to consider our request for additional funding to continue this program. So seniors sometimes are odd people. They like to have a purpose, and there's a lot of us. Will that purpose be to continue um, having educational fun and entertainment from things that our um, ACE coordinator does? Or if this is not available, I can just see them writing letters to the editor. They're picking up phones, calling their counselors, saying, huh, the sidewalk needs fixing, the, some, the car's parked in front of me. So would you like to see them Zoom or it's up to you? <laughs> and if I didn't convince you, um, perhaps our next speaker can, Willa Wick. Willa Wick, you had the furthest distance to go today. <laughs> Welcome, Thank Willa. You. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to be here. It's kind of hard to expand on what Ruth just did, but as one of those seniors, I'm not a senior, 
except for the fact that if you go over 55 as your limit for as your entry into seniors, I'm way over that. And I really enjoy the sessions that Helen has um, presented, as well as Glynis with the uh, the Zoom sessions. A lot of us, the seniors were really hesitant on joining Zoom. They didn't know how it worked. And Glynis and Helen and some of the others that were techie got them onto it. It was very simple and, and they enjoyed it. And there are seniors out there who barely even looked at their computer who now join in and try and make fun with everything. Uh, between the Zoom programs and the luncheons, nobody's mentioned the, the luncheon yet. Once a month in Drayton, Clifford, Harrison, and Palmerston, there's a seniors luncheon. And it's really rolling. There's a speaker for each one. And that's grabbing a hold. We had to close for uh, COVID, but now it's picking up again. At each one of the Zoom sessions, we have an interesting speaker. At each one of the luncheons, we have another speaker or a music session. And again, most of them are seniors that come. All of them enjoy it. It's an excellent way to meet new people. A lot of us that were on Zoom had no idea who these other 30 people were. But most of them, or a lot of them, started to attend the, the luncheons, and then we met these people that we only knew by faces. Uh, the newsletter has kept everyone in touch. If you forget what's going on, you can go back to the newsletter. And the nice thing about these seniors' events is we know when they are. They're mostly... Uh, on a regular basis, like the luncheons in Harriston are the last Friday of every month. The one, luncheons in Clifford are the third Wednesday. So there's regularity to it, which seniors like. And Helen mentioned the, the Facebook. Um, if, the, if they're on a computer and they have Zoom, then most of them are on Facebook too. And can take advantage of the um, contests that Glynis provides. And a lot of us, as Ruth mentioned, there was um, a life in the, a day in the life of, and many of us have done that. I've done several presentations for the Zoom sessions and get you thinking, what are you going to present? How do you present? Someone who never wanted to present before. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. But they can. So, yes, we certainly hope that we can get the funding to keep Glennis or the ACE coordinators program going, position going, for at least another year. Thank you. Thanks, Willa. We're certainly well aware uh, of, uh, of the Senior Center for Excellence and... Uh, We've supported it for a number of years now, and and I'm not sure if there's any questions. Uh, we definitely are aware of it, and we appreciate you ladies coming today. Uh, but this is a budget item, and we'll be talking about it uh, in the very uh, near future. So unless there's uh, questions, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson. Um, just a couple of questions. How do people go about how do people go about getting signed up to get your newsletter in the mail for those people who don't have computers or don't have? Um, well, we include the um, phone number in the newsletter so people can call and register. And a lot of people who come to the dining programs also, um, even though they may have email, they prefer a paper copy. So we, as soon as we get their name and address, we add them to our list. And we have caregivers too that call in for their mom, that they want their mom to get the newsletter and they're added to our mailing list.
And I'm just glad that we're mindful of the people who don't have the major connectivity and keeping them involved as well. Those who said it would be welcome for them to continue because anything to keep them connected and in touch with each other, I think is vital to their carrying on now, with, especially with COVID. COVID might be over or we've a bit, but people are still pretty cautious looking for care. Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. If there isn't any other questions, um, thank you for your consideration. We appreciate it. appreciate your time. Thank you, Helen, and you folks can stay as long as you want. <laughs> well, I'll entertain- a We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll entertain a motion to take a five minute bio break. Thank you, Councillor Dirksen, Deputy Mayor Anderson, all in favor. Uh, okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can I I'll entertain a motion to move back uh, into open council? Thank you, Councilor Councilor Zimmerman. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Anderson. All in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you. So uh, we're going to get into our fifth public meeting. This has to do with the ZBA 2022-07 Town of Minto Commercial Housekeeping Amendment. And I will act as the chair of the public meeting. And I'll call the meeting to order and ask our clerk, McRobb, to ensure that any members have signed in, sorry. And I'll also state that in a in, if a person or public body does not make an oral submission at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Town of Minto before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Town of Minto to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of the appeal before the tribunal unless, in the opinion of the board, there are reasonable grounds to do so. I will ask our clerk to state the municipal address and the legal description. Uh, thank you, Mayor Turton. The proposed amendment affects all central commercial zone C1 lands in the Town of Minto. The purpose and effect of the proposed amendment is to remove hotel as a permitted use within the central commercial C1 zone. Presently, this zoning bylaw permits hotel use in central commercial C1 zone. Uh, revise the accessory residential use regulations within the central commercial C1 zone to prohibit accessory residential uses on the ground floor of a commercial building. Presently, the zoning bylaw permits that 49% of the rear portion of the ground floor of a commercial building may be used uh, for accessory residential uses. The notices were mailed to the applicable agencies and was published in the Wellington Advertiser on November 10th, 2022. Our reports have been received from the Wellington County and from the town of Minto. So I'll, I'll ask uh, Matthew Dawu to provide comments and when he's finished, we'll ask Ashley Sawyer, our town of Minto planning coordinator to, to move right in, thank you. Perfect, thank you and through you, Chair. Uh, before you today is a zone amendment for a zoning bylaw housekeeping to refine the permitted uses um, and accessory residential regulations in the C1 zone. Uh, council may recall the last housekeeping which was in May of 2022, this year. Um, and through day-to-day -day usage of the bylaw and in consultation with staff, uh, we're doing our best to keep the bylaw as accurate and user-friendly as we can. Um, so with that said, the first notable change is the removal of hotel as a permitted use in the C1 zone. Uh, the proposed change would align with the vision of the county official plan. Uh, for the most part, C1 zones are located within the central business district designation, uh, which seeks to serve the needs of pedestrian oriented uh, traffic as opposed to the traveling public. Uh, further, as mentioned with the C1 zones being in the heart of urban centers, the subject lands are typically smaller in size, um, which do pose zoning issues specifically around parking. Um, so as noted in my report, hotels will remain a permitted use within the highway commercial C2 zones. Um, the, the last sort of notable change here as well, um, planning and staff are proposing to remove the accessory residential use provision within the C1 zone to prohibit accessory residential uses on the ground floor of a commercial building. Uh, council may be familiar with the bylaws current provisions, which permits that 49% of the rear portion of the ground floor of a commercial building may be used for accessory residential. 
Uh, the proposed change will ensure that commercial uses remain the primary use in C1 zones. Uh, planning staff note that the proposed change will still permit residential units above commercial units um, as a right in the C zone. Um, so the aforementioned accessory residential provisions is proposed to remain in the C2 as well as C3 zones. Um, and a bylaw has been brought for council's consideration this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Ashley, you want to move right into your report, please? Perfect. Uh, so I think Matt's covered it very well. Um, I'm just going to add a few more points. Um, so from the town's perspective, we were asked by the Economic Development and Planning Committee um, to explore the option of removing these accessory residential units um, as a permitted use on the ground floor. Um, the concern was that this is rendering commercial spaces too small for businesses to operate out out of and as town staff we we've had many discussions and we determined that we had to find a delicate balance between protecting these commercial uses in our downtown core for the long term while also ensuring that we do not hinder residential development in the time when housing supply is lacking um, as i mentioned after internal discussions uh, we did agree with the economic development committee that removing residential uses on the ground floor but remain they're remaining permitted above um, was the best option to move forward to protect our downtown cores um, no changes are proposed within the other commercial zones regarding accessory residential units. Um, and in terms of the hotel change, that is something that Wellington North has recently adopted. Um, our bylaws are nearly identical, and it's always good to maintain consistency with your neighbor. Thank you, Ashley. So we have no one uh, uh, wishing to comment in favor or in opposition. So we'll move right along to the next item then and have council opportunity for questions. Councillor Elliott. I, I was part of the economic group, uh, group and uh, what we were finding at, as a group, and as Linda pointed out, we were finding that there was uh, commercial people that wanted to move into our community, but there was no space for them. And the space that was available was too small and it was easier for the landlord to take some residential spot and make that another apartment. And therefore the, the front part of it was never, never enough to make it real commercial. So that's, the reasoning behind it. Deputy Mayor Anderson. So, um, is, is it my understanding then that if there's people who are currently uh, have residential space behind businesses, will they be allowed to stay or will they be asked to leave? Like, when does that take effect or do they get grandfathered in or how does that play in? Uh, so, it'll become legal non conforming. Um, so we won't be asking them to leave or anything like that. And it's not to say that we wouldn't entertain variances or zoning down the road, but this is where we're at um, right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's nothing else then. Uh, if you wish to be notified of the decision of the Council of Town of Minto in respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application, you must make a written request to the clerk of the Town of Minto at 5941 Highway 89. Harrison, NOG 1ZO, or by email, uh, Annaline at town.minto.on.ca. So if there's no further comments, I will adjourn this public meeting. So thank you. So the next item on the agenda is uh, public question period. <laughs> continue. Uh, I move by Councillor Gunson. Seconded by Councillor Zimmerman that uh, the council receives the correspondence as information, unless there's something that we want to pull out to discuss. I do know that the uh, uh, more homes built faster, uh, our staff is all over this one. We've had many discussions about it, and I'm sure uh, Matthew has as well. Matthew, thank you for coming. Sorry, we. Sorry we tied you up so long. No, happy to be here. Curtis, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so if uh, there's no none that want to be pulled out, all in favor of that motion? That's carried. Thank you very much. So we're into reports of committees. Um, there is no committee minutes for approval. And I'm going to pass the chair to Councillor Gunson, who is the Chair of Public Works, to assume the chair. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. Uh, we have one report today, and it's PW2022-029. It's uh, to do with the DWQMS review and QMS policy statement. 
and DWQMS endorsement. And Mike's going to present that for us. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Councilor Benson. Um, so I'm trying to keep this as quick and as brief as possible. I'm trying to say that'll work. Um, so just with the uh, new council and the existing council, uh, we're just going to do a quick uh, little review and uh, background of uh, DWQMS. Um, so we'll just quickly go over uh, why quality management system, uh, what is a quality management system, where do you learn about uh, the system, uh, what your roles and responsibilities related to QMS are, and then the next steps in maintaining the, the DWQMS. So a bit of background, uh, after Walkerton, uh, Justice O'Connor recommended a uh, quality management system uh, be employed by all uh, municipalities and uh, drinking water authorities. Uh, QMSs have been around for over uh, 30 years, used in hundreds and thousands of uh, organizations. Um, and uh, process control rather than uh, product control. Uh, DWQMS borrows heavily on ISO uh, 9001 and 1401. Uh, it's influenced by uh, ACID, which is used in the food industry and uh, is an acronym for hazardous analysis uh, and critical control points. Um, the main uh, thing with uh, the DWQMS is to uh, devise a plan, to follow through with the plan, check how the plan is operating, and uh, always uh, look to improve on our plan. Uh, the quality management system, um, we generate processes um, and documentation for assuring quality um, that can be independently verified and uh, build a foundation for product integrity, customer satisfaction, uh, consumer satisfaction, and continual improvement. Uh, so main object objectives of the DWQMS are to reduce uh, employee operational and financial risk, um, reduce variation, improve operational performance, uh, identify best practices, and as I mentioned, create a foundation for succession and growth. Um, some benefits are uh, confirms uh, ownership um, of the drinking water system, improves utility performance, reduces operational risk, promotes uh, confidence in the owner, operator, and consumer, uh, foundation for continual improvement, and we try to be more uh, proactive and preventative than more reactive um, with our procedures. Uh, some system components uh, starts with the quality policy, uh, which I will um, review and read later on at the end of this presentation. Um, operational plan uh, defines approach, uh, organization, and responsibilities. The procedures describe who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, work instructions explains how we um, conduct our, um, our work. And then other documentation provides uh, objective evidence. Where to learn about uh, DWQMS, uh, it all starts with uh, the policy statement, as I mentioned, we'll probably read later. Um, and it can be found on our town website. It's also posted in the administrative building uh, and all of our offices. It covers uh, maintenance and continual improvement of the QMS provide safe drinking water and complying with uh, applicable legislation and regulations. Um, so the operational, excuse me, operational plan uh, includes endorsement um, by the owner and top management, description of the drinking water system, uh, description of every, or every element of the standard, um, some key procedures um, are located in, within the operational plan. Our copies are located at uh, the well houses and the public workshops, as well as the admin office. Um, all these procedures are uh, reviewed with uh, new hire and annually uh, we go over it with uh, all of our operators. Uh, some. So, uh, a lot of the DWQMS procedures uh, are related to document and record control, 
risk assessment, competencies, personnel coverage, communications, essential uh, supplies and services, uh, review and provision of infrastructure, sampling, testing, and monitoring, calibration, emergency management, internal and external auditing, corrective actions, and management review. The, for emergency response procedures, um, they don't necessarily need to uh, cover all potential emergencies, um, but they are largely based on our risk assessment outcomes. Uh, every year we do a um, bit of a tabletop exercise or in the field kind of with the, kind of the most current or hot uh, risk associated with our drinking water system. Um, some of them have been related to main breaks, cross connection of backflow, and state of communication and failure. Critical control points and procedures are identified um, and uh, limits are set for such things as uh, low chlorination, um, sabotage, like wherever um, we deem a point of control for our drinking water system so we can maintain safe drinking water for the public. Uh, corrective actions uh, are generated through uh, external audits, internal audits, and different other uh, things that go on um, on our day-to-day -day operations, uh, as well as staff suggestions and uh, other input from additional people. Uh, this is just a example, one example of our, uh, our corrective action response or CAR as we acronym for it. Um, roles and responsibilities and authorities are identified within the operational plan. Uh, the following roles are identified within the plan. Uh, owner, uh, the mayor and council, public works committee, CAO, treasurer, or any other member of top management, a QMS representative, water and sewer uh, managers, operators, accounting and water clerk, and water and sewer billing clerk. As for what comes next, it's it's more just, uh, don't like the term what comes next, but it's more for just how we maintain our uh, DWQMS. Um, by reviewing our documents uh, on a regular basis, following the documentation, uh, in-house and internal audit, and uh, the down here, external auditing by SAI, SAI Global. Uh, implementation of corrective actions, always looking to continually improve our uh, drinking water quality management system. Uh, management review and endorsement of the plan by uh, owner and top management. We always, as I mentioned, look to continually improve uh, the DWQMS. Um, talks with uh, the representative, um, being myself or uh, Todd, the water supervisor, um, making suggestions, um, as we always, like I said, always like to grow and change, and then respond to and discuss uh, any corrective actions that have been identified. Uh, maintaining a successful QMS um, is, uh, it's, um, it's a team effort in maintaining it. Um, all the way down from myself to, and Todd to our operators. So without everybody kind of putting in, uh, we have no system in place. Uh, read and ask questions is always important and share knowledge like as we uh, hire new operators or whatever from uh, addition or different workspaces and different systems. If any additional knowledge can be shared with us, then that makes us uh, and our system. <coughs> and then if you have any questions about that, ask. Yeah, but I will read the uh, our policy statement here now. Uh, so the town of Minto is committed to supplying a consistent and safe drinking water supply which meets or exceeds all regulatory standards. We strive to achieve these goals through creating and managing a system comp comprised of policies and procedures which exhibit ongoing evaluations, staff competency, 
through training, communications of pertinent information with uh, the consumers, the town staff, workplace safety, and contingency response measures. The med, uh, management and staff of the town of Minto are committed to producing, maintaining, and continually improving the uh, quality management system. And with that, uh, just look for your endorsement of the policy and of your continual improvement of our commitment <laughs> of uh, the DWQMS and the operational plan. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. So I've got a recommendation moved by Councillor Podnowitz and seconded by Deputy Mayor Anderson that Council of the Town of Mental receives report PW 2022-029 regarding the 2022 DWQMS review and QMS policy statement and DWQMS endorsement and that all council members review, approve and endorse the DWQMS policy statement, as well as their commitment to the drinking water quality management standard and the DWQMS operational plan. This is a good time for this report because there was five of us in walking in on Monday or Tuesday <laughs> taking the, uh, the responsibilities of the Safe Water Drinking Act. So very good. Um, any questions for Mike? You, Chair Gunson. I just want to uh, just quickly, Todd asked me to pass along that um, he's been to a couple training sessions and uh, kudos to council for the commitment and the support that they give this. Um, he was there and able to brag about how Minto's council supports the DWQMS process 100% and is very supportive of the staff and that. And, and he said that's not the norm with municipalities out there. And a lot of operators and DWQMS coordinators say they have to fight to get council to listen to them and have that report. So just a kudos to you guys for your support of the system and the, the seriousness that you put into this and, and allow Mike and, and Todd to do a great job that they do. So just want to pass that along. Thanks, Ray. Any other questions? Chairman Gunson, I think the board and myself and others have been involved with this DWQMS from day one. I know when we sat around the table quite a number of years ago and talked about uh, you know where we're going with it but we're very fortunate here we've had uh, three extremely good leaders uh, on this DWQMS and so Mike thank you for your dedication uh, because we're we, like uh, Chris says we're right here behind you we, we need the best water that we can get to, to drink to serve our customers so I noticed you changed that to uh, something to customers in our envision statement Customers, uh, yeah, there was a, a change from where it said consumers, yeah. it was customers. So. so thank you. No other questions? So if there's no other questions, then I'll call for the vote. All in favor? All those against? That's passed. You just want me to move the chair right to Deputy Mayor Anderson? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gunson. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to... I am extremely brief. This is a, <laughs> this is just a routine agreement extension. The agreement is about to come to an end with North Perth. We've had this agreement with them for 30, 40 years. This is just extending the agreement. It's it's well done. It's carried on with the cola it increases every year. So um, there's no qualms on our part. And uh, we just recommend that you approve this so we can sign the agreement and send it back to them. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll read the recommendation. The Council of the Town of Minto consider passing a bylaw authorizing the mayor and clerk to sign the fire agreement with the Town of North Perth, extending the agreement, that's the, the agreement, for seven more years. All those in favor? Anybody again? That's carried. And I'll pass the chair back to uh, Mayor Kirk. Thank you, and I'll ask uh, Gwen Porter to present the next report. It's the council 2023 council meeting dates. Sure, I feel like the pressure's on now because that was like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're off to a bad start. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
Um, so uh, through you, Chair Turton, this is a really quick report that we bring every year to set your meeting dates for the year prior, usually the year, the next year, usually we bring it in like August, but as this was an election year, we decided to wait until the new council was in. So as written in our procedural bylaw, your meeting dates are generally the first and third Tuesday of each month. However, the Roma and Good Roads conferences do fall on regular meeting dates. So we did move those meetings around a little bit. Um, so in 2023, you will have 26 regular council and budget meetings. Usually it would be 24, but again, with it being an election year, we can't start budget until January. So all I'm really looking for is approval of this schedule that you see right here. Thank you, Quinn. Everyone has had an, an opportunity to have a look at this. Uh, is there any comments? Yes. Councilor Dirksen. No, oh, thank you, Mayor Turton. Um, so, if uh, if we had a lot of planning issues, we would uh, we would try to book another meeting then to get through some of them. That would still stand. That would still stand as yeah, because we had done that for twenty one, twenty two years. Okay, thank you. Councilor Elliott. How much notice do we need if we're going to go, like, obviously we're going to go in camera at some of these and it might be starting at 2.30 or even 2 o'clock. How much notice do we have to give the public? Uh, just the same notice of a regular meeting, right? It, the agenda would go out on the Friday, whether it's in camera or not. Yeah, it could be like a 24 hour notice. I think it's, I'd have to double check the procedural bylaw, but um, it does state like a 24 hour. It all depends on if it's an emergency thing that's a little bit different, right? If we have to right. be closed for an emergency exactly. reason, as long as an agenda is put out on the um, uh, out as soon as possible, then that's would cover it. And if we open those meetings, they have to open it right on time. We can't, we can't, if it's a three o'clock meeting or it's a 2 30 meeting, we have to start the meeting at that time. We can't delay it. Well, we should try to open it on time, but there are I think we said many circumstances where we always can't open it on time. If we don't have a quorum or, quorum. you know, there's, yes, if we have quorum, we would probably open it on I time. Think right? yes. I think the public are expecting that. Right. I think so. If you advertise it, then it has to start. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay. Then the recommendation is from Councillor Dirksen, seconded by Councillor Potnovich, that the Council of Town of Minter receives report CL 2022-013 regarding 2023 council meetings, dates, and sets the meeting date for the 2023 as outlined. All in favor of that motion? Yes, that's carried. Thank you. Quinn, you're, you've got an opportunity to redeem yourself here. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. With the multi-year accessibility plan and the 2022 accessibility update. Um, yeah, so this is another, well, half of it is another report that we bring every year, giving council an update on all of the accessibility initiatives that we have accomplished throughout this year. So starting with that, uh, with our renovation here of the council chambers, we did have a removable um, ramp built so that in the future, the council desk is accessible to anyone with mobility issues. Um, also in speaking with our community services uh, director, Matthew Lubers, we dealt with a number of accessibility issues at the Palmerston Arena with the expansion and the renovation, including like an automatic door and accessible washrooms and some other upgrades. Um, we also in 2022 created a return to work program, which outlines how and when our employees are able to return to work when they are injured or ill, either on the job or off. Um, Matt also applied for funding from the County of Wellington Accessibility Fund to purchase some accessible picnic tables for the parks. And I received notice that we got that money today so he can, can go ahead and buy those. Um, the next part of the report is the update to the multi-year accessibility plan. Uh, it recently expired. We do it for five years every time and it follows a number of accessibility standards that are set down by the province. It's fairly large document as you can see it's about 10 pages but the majority of the items that are listed in here are items that we actually already do as a municipality so all of the training for staff 
all of that sort of stuff is something that we do make sure that we do every year. We work very closely with the Accessibility Advisory Committee. So anytime we do renovations or expansions or anything else, we work with them to make sure that everything is um, up to accessibility standards. So all in all, um, I'm here if you have any questions, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward. And like I said, it's stuff that we, we already make sure that we do. So I know it looks like a lot to take on, but um, most of it is already happening, so. Questions? Deputy Mayor Anderson. Um, I have a question about, um, I considered accessibility, but communication for people, we do an awful lot of it online now, and for people who don't have access to that, they get left not knowing what's happening. So I don't know if there's a way to ensure that things that we feel are worthy of putting on the website, that we also have a paper copy. And I've, we've talked about this at some other committees that I sit on. And whether we have a, a weekly or a monthly update that we put into the Wellington Advertiser or talk to them about doing that, I think if we were talked about it at Cultural Roundtable, people need to know. And if they don't have access to computers, they're left out in the cold, right? Especially the people who have a mobility issue on top of being a senior citizen. They're not getting out to see the poster boards. They're not getting out. So I would just like to ensure that we have something in there defining that we're actively seeking. And I know everybody faces the same challenge. It's easy to put it all on the web, but it's not available for everybody when it's just on the web. Yeah, no, that's, um, that is definitely a good point and something that we can look into. I know um, the Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, through the county, they will quite often put things out in the Wellington Advertiser, like as a group. So um, working with them is something that, like a little bit more, is something that I can definitely look into too. Um, yeah, I wonder if there could be a flavor for it, like across the county, that it goes in, the, the paper serves everybody, if we could work together for that, because I recognize there's a cost to putting it in the paper, but I think they'd probably work with us to make sure that the news is out there for the people who don't have access to computers or cell phones. Yeah, no, for I sure. Appreciate that. Other questions for Quinn? Thank you, Quinn. So, uh, moved by Councillor Zimmerman, seconded by Councillor Elliott. That the Council of the Town of Mitchell receives the report CL 2022 014 regarding the multi year accessibility plan and the 2022 accessibility update, and further that the Council endorses the multi year accessibility plan as written. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. So we're going to move along to the uh, Court of Revision on the Ontario Drainage Act, and I'll ask Anlene to uh, give us a report. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to pull up my report here. Uh, this one's fairly simple. This is something that we do pass every four years. Um, so the role of the Court of Revision is laid out in Section 97 of the Drainage Act. As you saw tonight, we had the engineers come and give their report. Uh, the next step will be the quarter of revision if we pass the bylaw uh, with first and second reading tonight. Um, so the quarter of revision states that there has to be three or five members. That's the way it's set. Last time what we did is we appointed the mayor, deputy mayor, and chair of public works, plus two alternates um, to cover up quarter of revision during the term of council. That would be the 2022 to 2026 term of council uh, this time around. Um, my suggestion would be I know that maybe you had spoken to some members of council, uh, that it be the three that were spoken about, as well as Judy Dirksen and Ron Elliott to be the alternate members of um, the Court of Revision. Really don't have a whole lot to add to it. This is something that we, uh, we don't do Court of Revision on a, a regular basis. It's not something that we have a lot, but I think there'll be a lot more coming forward over the next years. Um, and so, um, it's important that we have it in place. Thank you, Annaline. So moved by Deputy Mayor Anderson, second by Councillor Dirksen, that the Council of the Town of Minto receives report CL 2022-015 regarding the Ontario Drainage Act, Court of Revision. Uh, and further that the Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Chair of Public Works plus two alternate, alternates be appointed to the Court of Revision during 2022-2026 term of council. And that the recommendation could then be changed to say instead of Two alternates, the two alternates being uh, Judy Dirksen and Ron Elliott. So they're, that they're named in the motion. Deputy Mayor Anderson, are you okay with that change? I am indeed. Uh, Councillor Dirksen, are you okay with that change? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. All in favor of that motion? That's carried. 
Thank you very much. We're, we've come to the point in the meeting where we have announcements. Um, and that is uh, similar to what we did last year or the last 12 years. Anybody has anybody more, anything that they want to talk about? Now's the time. So what we'll do is we'll start with Councillor Elliott and we'll go around. Or unless you just want to put your hand up and just... I'm just, I'm excited about what happened over at Christmas events, all the different parades and and different programs that we've held so far, still more to come, but I, I just can't believe the turnout of, of our community. And that's got to go to credit to the staff that are, are putting that on, the volunteers that have done it. So it's, I'm amazed, each year it grows. So, you know, huge. I thank our staff and I thank our volunteers for doing that. Thank you, Ed. Go ahead. Thank you, Ron. Go ahead, Jeff. No. So I, I'm in the same boat. It's pretty amazing how our, our our folks have come out, but to the different events, and it's uh, great that our staff is uh, working so hard. So the other thing is, last night was the uh, Chamber of Commerce um, Christmas party get together, and. Uh, Councillor Potnovitz and Deputy Mayor Anderson were out to that and it was a great night and uh, we owe a huge debt to our staff for planning all that, all those, all those side meetings and uh, celebrations and what have you. Um, so, thank you. Go ahead. I don't really have anything except a reminder about the Christmas dinner. If anybody knows of people who will be sitting at home alone or will you be cooking the dinner for themselves? Let us know. We'll arrange that to have a meal delivered to them or invite them down or bring them down to the hall if needed be to Ariston this year. Um, and we're looking forward to doing that on Christmas Day. Gene, yes, sir. Are you, is, are there people out of town, like at the edge of town or something? Oh yeah, we it, take all from So them. anyone? Okay. Anyone at all, we don't turn anybody. Sure. We've had them from as far and away as Owen Sound and Rockwood some reason. Have you? Yeah. Great. Anybody that needs a place to eat or a meal to eat, We'll make sure they get it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, looking back. Okay, thank you very much. So, like a motion to move, uh, return to regular council, moved by Councillor Dunson, second by Deputy Mayor Anderson that the council or the committee of the whole convenes in regular council. All in favor? That's carried. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, when you get to the bylaws, I just have a couple Okay. Of so any notices of motion? Seeing none, uh, moved by Councillor Botnovitz and uh, seconded by Councillor Gunson uh, that the Council of Town of Minto ratifies the motions made in Committee of Whole. All in favor? Against? That's carried. Thank you. And now we're using the bylaws, Annalee. Yes, through you, Mayor Turton, I know that it was discussed about uh, the deferral of the first bylaw for the amending of the zoning uh, baseline road. So uh, if we can pull that out of the uh, other one, and I could read that for your consideration, would be that bylaw number 2022-103 be deferred for consideration at a future council meeting. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Okay. Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Dirksen. All, all in favor of that uh, motion? That's carried. Thank you. And then the, uh, as we go on down the line here. Um, it would read the same except that the, the bylaw 103 be pulled out of that one. Okay. So moved by Councillor Plotnovitz, second by Deputy Mayor Anderson, that the Council Town of Minto receives the PW 2022-029 regarding the... Sorry. Sorry, am I... Uh, yeah, uh, it's the resolution would be um, moved by Councillor Elliott and seconded by Councillor Plotnovitz. That bylaw number is 2022-104, okay. 2022-105. And 2022-106 be read a first, second, third time. Pass an open council and seal and seal the corporation. Okay. All in favor of that motion? Against? Yes. That's good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I was on the wrong page. Sorry. Thank and you, then Emily. <laughs> so the, the next one then. Um, yes. <clears throat> municipal drain number 102 provision bylaw. Moved by Councillor Dirksen, second by Councillor Elliott. That Bylaw 2022-107 be read a first and second time and provisionally adopted in open council. All in favor? Against? That's carried. Uh, confirmation uh, bylaw uh, moved by Councillor Zimmerman, seconded by Councillor Dirksen, that bylaw 2022-108 to confirm actions of the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Minto 
expecting a meeting held December 6, 2022, be read a first, second, and third time and passed in open council and sealed with the seal of the corporation. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Adjournment. Um, Deputy Mayor, sorry, moved by Deputy Mayor Anderson, second by Councillor Zimmerman, that the Council of Town of Minto adjourns to meet again at the call of the mayor. All in favor of that? Thank you very much. I think we just broke a record. Thank you. Thank you.